The November rally peters out on this final trading day of the month. Live from Studio 2 at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Kicking off to closing bell here in the U.S. As Scarlett just mentioned, we're hitting a little bit of a wall when it comes to that November rally. The S&P 500 off by about two-tenths of a percent right now. Big tech feeling it even more. You can see the Nasdaq 100 off by about nine-tenths of a percent. Of course, this comes after a stellar month. You wouldn't know it by looking at the screen today. Then you take a look at the bond market. Of course, the story of November has been that bond market rally. Some of that is being given back at the moment. Ten-year yields up by about eight basis points or so. But look at the level that we're talking about. 4.33%. I remember when we were at 5%. And finally, take a look at the dollar. Scarlet getting a little bit of a haven bid, of course, as other assets falter here. The Bloomberg dollar index up about four tenths of a percent. All right. When it comes to the catalyst for today, a flood of data released, adding to evidence that the U.S. economy is slowing. You look at consumer spending, inflation, and the labor market, they have all cooled in recent weeks, which should reassure the Fed that its current policy is sufficiently restrictive and its hiking cycle is pretty much complete. Of course, that's a very different scenario than the rate cuts that the market is currently pricing in. All right, let's make a deal in the healthcare space because drug maker AbbVie is shelling out $10.1 billion to acquire Immunogen in order to gain access to cancer treatments. Analysts see little reason for regulators to get in the way. It's a different story, though, for Cigna and Humana. The two health insurers are in talks to combine, but a deal would almost certainly face anti trust hurdles. Now, turning back to the markets where the November rally has petered out, as we mentioned, signs of buyer exhaustion. But Katie, it's been quite the rally. You've been tallying up the numbers. What do you see? Well, like you said, it's been quite the rally, but alone from just the bare numbers, what's really striking about what happened in November is the fact of how broad it was. Over here at the bottom, you can see the number of sectors that were up on the month. In November, 10 of 11 sectors were higher, almost a perfect score. You can trust that to the previous few months where we only had one or two sectors maybe higher on the month. Clearly, this rally broadening out, hitting a wall, but broader uh, on the month. Let's talk about what's going on in the bond market, because a big reason why you started to see some relief come back into the stock market was the fact that you had bonds actually not trade with so much pain. Of course, it was a big global bond rally. I don't know if the chart behind me necessarily speaks to that. Uh, but we talk about what's been happening in the U.S. Treasury market. But of course, Scarlett, what's striking is that it wasn't just Treasuries. It was around the the globe as well. Yields finally dropping a little bit. Absolutely. Great setup here. So let's kick things off with Sarah Malik. She is chief investment officer over at Nuveen. And Sarah, I want to key off of that idea that it's been quite the November rally. Did this rally pull forward gains in December? Did it steal performance from the expected Santa Claus rally? Well, Santa's definitely visited the markets early this year for three reasons. Inflation is moderating. The Fed has signaled the end of rate hikes. And the economy's cooling, but it's not so cold that we have to worry about an imminent recession. When you see Novembers like this, and it will probably be the second best November for returns in 20 years, you usually do get follow through by a little bit in December. But this week, Fed speak has been throwing some water on the markets, uh, talking about will they or won't they start to cut interest rates. And I think the setup for 2024 is a little bit complicated. The markets are expecting four rate cuts starting in March. I think that's optimistic because the pieces in place of inflation being at or under target and a recession for the economy probably aren't going to be here by March. Yeah, that's a really good point, especially when you have someone like Bill Ackman calling for a rate cut in the first quarter, which just seems fairly aggressive. Talk us through how that how that's going to make itself apparent over the next couple of weeks. Or is this something that won't really play out until January, this idea that rate cuts are or are not coming? It'll take a little bit of time to see economic data continue to roll out and see that the economy is not slowing as much as investors expect. And more inflation data that shows that we still are above target. Also, the Fed speakers are watering down the message and saying higher for longer, which is the camp that we're in. So we're positioning portfolios that are more resilient to an economic slowdown and also can benefit from inflation, such as real assets. Those are the key areas that we think uh, people should be thinking about for 2024. Can we talk a little bit more about what that looks like? Because, okay, real assets got it. But when you think about what would work uh, 
in a higher for longer environment where maybe we get that slowdown. Where does that leave you when it comes to risk assets, when it comes to treasury assets? Well, first looking at equities, there's asset classes such as REITs. REITs historically tend to outperform in a stable rate environment and when rates are being cut. So during that stable environment that we expect at least for the first half of 2024, REITs, which are trading at about an 8 to 10 percent discount to NAV, are important. We specifically like industrial REITs like Prologis, strong balance sheets, benefiting from near shoring and supply chain logistics coming back to the U.S. That's one area we like. We like dividend growers. These have been left behind this year because people have been putting their money in cash rather than looking for yield and equities. I think as yields on cash start to uh, flatten out or decline, people will look back at these companies with strong balance sheets and cash flows that can keep growing their dividends and offering yields to investors. How selective do you have to be when picking those dividend growers? Because there was a story on the terminal earlier uh, this week looking at some of these dividend tracking ETFs that have actually taken in a lot of money, but they've been under underperforming. So what, how active do you have to be when you're looking at dividends? It's definitely an active investor's play because this is more than just dividend yielding companies. We need to find the companies that have very strong balance sheets, that have the free cash flow to survive and, and, and even do well during a recession and can continue to grow their dividend and that we can be co comfortable that they'll be able to do that. So I think that is important with these stocks and they have significantly underperformed this year, which is why we think they're interesting at this point. Let's talk about earnings for a minute, because when you get past uh, some of the value stocks that are out there, earnings is going to be what's left to drive everything else. And we know that in the third quarter, that was the end of the earnings recession, right? Earnings are back to growing. But if you have an economy that's slated to slow down further in the first half of 2024, where does that leave us in terms of uh, how analysts and investors are bracing for the earnings to look like? Well, three things we're watching for 2024 to think about the markets. It's the economy, um, employment, and earnings. And then finally, of course, actually, fourth thing, the consumer. So let's talk about earnings. I think we can see earnings growth for 2024 because companies should be able to preserve margins as inflation continues to decline. We're expecting earnings growth of about a little over 7% with basically minimal to no valuation expansion for the markets because valuations are already at a premium. Now moving on to the consumer, this is our main worry for 2024. We're already seeing cracks with the consumer in terms of delinquencies on their credit cards. Average interest rates on credit cards are over 20% at this time. People are spending less at restaurants. I think the consumer will finally be the key that moves us into a recession as they have a hangover from all the stimulus that happened during the pandemic. And then the employment markets follow the consumer into a recession. So, but earnings growth is where we're hanging our hats and saying we can get some earnings growth in 2024 as companies preserve their margins in a lower cost environment. So as the consumer gets more stretched and ratchets down spending, what are the areas where the spending will still remain and you can look to as, as safety plays? Well, consumers have been spending very heavily on services rather than goods. I think both those areas will continue to be at risk. So travel, uh, consumer basically luxury goods, I think all of that would be at risk. Mm. Of course, consumer staples, they've been hit pretty hard because of some of the weight loss drugs. But I think staples, of course, food, companies like Costco is where you'll continue to spend. And then, of course, corporate spending continues on areas that are necessary. I think this ranges from artificial intelligence to software to make your companies more productive in an, in an environment that's tougher. You mentioned weight loss drugs. I got to go there. You <laughs> mentioned it, particularly in a in relation to some of these staples. It has been amazing to watch the Ozempic effect, if you want to call it that. Uh, when it comes to maybe not just weight loss drugs specifically, but you think about what's going on there, you think about artificial intelligence earlier in the year. It feels like when these when the market latches on to these themes, there's a lot of babies that get thrown out with the bathwater. I think the question is, what, which is a bubble, which is a fad, which is a long-term trend? I'll start with artificial intelligence. I think that is a real trend. It really can help companies increase productivity. Even in asset management, where we're managing money, we can now look back at our trading history, help make us better investors. Our analysts' ability to, uh, to absorb information, all of that is, is much better because of artificial intelligence. Intelligence. I think that's here to say companies like Microsoft have such a huge lead in that. I think that advantage remains. Weight loss drugs, you know, I think that might be a little bit still unknown as to the impact there. But with Staples, what I am worried about is their ability to hold on to pricing in a lower cost environment. My concern is that they already have fairly thin margins. Mm. And as inflation goes down, I think their pricing might follow and they may not have the earnings growth that we would hope. All right, Sarah, really appreciate your joining us. Sarah Malik is Chief Investment Officer over at Naveen, giving us a lot to think about for 2024. In the meantime, coming up on the close, U.S. consumer spending, inflation, and the labor market all showing signs of weakening. You add it all up, 
the economy is slowing. We'll take a look at what it could mean for how Jay Powell frames this tomorrow. Plus, Ulta releases its latest results after the bell. We'll get a preview on what to watch with Olivia Tong. She is an analyst over at Raymond James. And we'll look at the challenges ahead for the U.S. farming sector. Our guest is Tom Halverson. He is CoBank president and CEO. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Tuesday, a special episode of Bloomberg Surveillance live from Apollo's headquarters. Join Tom, John, and Lisa for exclusive interviews with top leaders in finance, including Apollo's Mark Rowan and Jim Zelter, about the state of private markets, recession risk in the new year, and deal making amid high interest rates. It's all happening December 5th, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Well, we got a fresh slate of economic data to digest today as investors await Fed Chair Powell's remarks tomorrow. Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Editor Mike McKee, he joins us now for a breakdown. And there's several things we could talk about here. Let's start with initial jobless claims uh, because the survey and the actual number that we got, they were actually right online. Economists nailed it. We give them a blue star yeah. for that today. Uh, 218,000, which is what we were, where roughly we were two weeks ago that we had this uh, big drop off. But basically what it shows is that uh, we are seeing more initial job of claims, but not very many. The continuing claims number, though, uh, 1,927,000 is up significantly. It does show it's taking longer for people to get jobs. So it kind of shows that the labor market might be loosening up a little bit. Yeah, that continuing claims number is, I believe, a two year high or something close to it. Um, talk a little bit about what this means in terms of the narrative that's taken hold that the Fed is done with its rate hikes and perhaps may even start looking ahead to rate cuts. At least that's the market's interpretation. <laughs> well, the narrative is pretty much in line with what we're getting in terms of these numbers. So we saw personal incomes uh, slow down, a two-tenths rise, and within that, uh, wages and salaries only rose a tenth after about 11 months of rising a half percentage point or so. Uh, and so we're definitely seeing some wage pressure easing. If that continues, it's exactly what the Fed wants to see. The spending number is okay. It's not bad, but it's also way down from the uh, prior month. So we're seeing a slowdown in the economy. That's what the data are telling us. And then that was what was reflected in the inflation numbers. And that's uh, exactly what the Fed wants to see. Continued progress on PCE inflation. We're looking at a year-over-year -year basis for the uh, PCE uh, of 3%. And so we're very close to breaking into that two area, which would make a lot of people on Wall Street two happy. Two-ish, yes. So we hear from Jerome Powell tomorrow, which is very exciting. But let's talk about John Williams, of course, the New York Fed president. Uh, this is a pretty interesting quote that you highlighted, that rates, are, according to him, are the most restrictive in 25 years and that he expects it will be appropriate to maintain a restrictive stance for quite some time. And this is interesting, especially against the context of it feels like the Fed speak, at least at the beginning of the week, had been maybe tilting towards dovish. Well, I think this is dovish. Basically, he's saying we're all but saying we're done. Mm -hmm. And he's important because he, by uh, sort of tradition and definition, doesn't ever vote against the chairman. So if you know where John Williams or the New York Fed president is, you kind of know where Jay Powell is. And I would expect something like this from Powell tomorrow. Uh, Chris Waller got everybody's attention by saying, well, at some point we can cut interest rates, uh, but he didn't say when, and that's going to be the big issue. The dot plot already had them cutting rates in 2024. It's really a question of how fast inflation comes down and when they would get to it, but they don't want to put a timetable on it. So Williams didn't, and I wouldn't expect Powell to either. Let me qualify myself hawkish compared to what the market is pricing in, because quite some time you look at what's being priced in right now, it's quite some, a little bit of time, maybe a few months here. Well, we're looking at roughly May for uh, a rate uh, cut. Uh, and that all depends on how fast inflation goes down. Bill, Bill Ackman was talking earlier this week about the first quarter. That would require inflation to come down even faster to get to the point where the Fed feels it can start the rate cutting process without derailing the inflation fight. Uh, the only other way to do it is if we had a recession, which 
nobody at this point. The narrative, as mm -hmm. you said, at this point is not telling us that. Yeah, it's a fun thought exercise to think about what it would take to actually get rate cuts in the first quarter. Our thanks to Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Editor Mike McKee. And uh, it does feel like one of the main events of this week. I know that we got a lot of economic data that's fun to parse through, but to hear from Jerome Powell, one of his, I think it's the last opportunity for him to speak before the December Fed meeting could be consequential. Definitely. Anytime he opens his mouth, it's consequential. I believe the onus is really on him not to sound too, too dovish at mm -hmm. this point relative to what is being priced into the market. And it's interesting that Waller did talk about about rate cuts but gave no mention of timing because up until that point the only mention of rate cuts was from everyone saying we're not even close to talking or thinking about rate cuts yeah no I think that's a good point that the mission here is to not even give the appearance of being dovish I mean if their mission truly is to uh, stay on hold for some time here this is clearly a market that wants to lean dovish, oh, yeah. wants to price in those rate cuts but coming up on the close external theft and internal shrink pose a threat to Ulta's third quarter margins we'll preview what to expect when the health and beauty retailer reports after the closing bells this is the close on Bloomberg Time now for top calls. Look at some of the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start with Nutrien. BNP stepping away from its outperform rating on the fertilizer and chemicals company. The analyst instead turning neutral, saying that the supply and demand chain for potash presents long-term risk. Now, his main concern lies around oversupply, especially if large cap miners in Belarus and Russia boost their exports. You take a look at shares right now, down by about 2.5%. Next up, Restaurant Brands International, an upgrade to outperform from market perform over at Bernstein and price target set to $85. The analyst says that the Burger King parent company has a great turnaround story two years in the making. Unlike his peers, he's not worried about waning consumer demand and believes RBI is, quote, reclaiming its magic while it creates long-term value. Take a look at shares right now, up by about 1.7%. And finally, Jefferies sees positive catalysts for social media companies, Pinterest and Snap, lifting their ratings to buy from hold. Now, the analyst, he does admit that upgrading Snap is a, quote, controversial call, but he says that the rating is driven by strong revenue growth in North America. You take a look at shares right now, up by about 6.4%, and those are some of our top calls. Now, advertising, it does keep the lights on for social medias like Snap and Pinterest, and also retail like Ulta Beauty, they aren't too shy about promoting itself on those platforms. Now, its third quarter report comes out this afternoon, and some analysts are cautioning that it could miss expectations. That's due to theft and due to higher promotions. Now, for more on what to expect, we're joined by Olivia Tong. She is Raymond James' Managing Director of Equity Research and has a strong buy rating on Ulta. And Olivia, I want to start there because that's been one of the big conversation points around retailers is this idea of theft, of shrink. How are you thinking about that at a store like Ulta? Well, first, thanks thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, theft is a problem in shrink, and, and really it's the organized retail crime that's been the, the issue. Um, the company has done a couple of things in the store. One of them is adding more personnel and then also locking up particularly fragrances because that's been one that, you know, has unfortunately and, and fortunately for for uh, for some a um, a high resale value. And fragrance has been a really hot category, high price point, and um, and with that high resale value, that has been a challenge. Well, you mentioned fragrance, of course, being a bit of a bright spot here. But talk to us about beauty in general. Of course, it's been a really interesting consumer picture over the past year. Or so uh, there was a strong showing, it feels like, across the board on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. But how does beauty tend to perform when we start to see the consumer pull back? Beauty has been shockingly resilient of late and continues to be, uh, con we continue to see that across a number of different price points, both on the value end and also in the prestige end. Uh, I mentioned fragrance earlier. Fragrance has been off the charts in terms of interest and um, building sort of a portfolio uh, for consumers. Um, skincare is always important, you know, anti-aging. And then makeup has really seen uh, quite a resurgence, uh, partly because of social media, um, but uh, 
we would expect that these categories continue to stay fairly resilient relative to consumer average. You do have a lot of innovation out there. Obviously, social media has played a very, very big part. And there is a very wide range of um, brands that hit a lot of price points and a lot of categories. So there's a lot out there for the consumer. And it's a fun category to shop and a fun category to give. So uh, as you mentioned earlier, has looked really good for, for the holiday season so far. One thing you mentioned, Olivia, is that Ulta is well positioned across a wide range of price points. But when it comes to value items versus prestige items and inventory, does Ulta kind of need to make a call in advance of the holiday season on which one is going to do better or it has to be positioned for both regardless? You, you know, that's a good question. You want to have a good mix. But I think what's really important is that they are one of the few uh, retailers that have both the prestige and the mass. Uh, in the same store. So that consumer has the choice. And one of the great things about Alta is that they have this loyalty program, 90 plus percent of their members are part of the loyalty program. So Alta has perhaps the, one of the best mousetraps in terms of understanding the consumer. What are they buying? What, you know, how frequently are they buying? Are they making different brand choices now if they're feeling a little bit stretched now that, you know, you have uh, student loan repayments and things like that that are hitting them. So, so far we have not seen um, a material trade down. If anything, you know, there are some categories where, uh, where mass is doing better than prestige, but that is more, quite frankly, around innovation, mm. I think, than, than price point. So I'm glad you mentioned innovation. You talk about how a robust pace of innovation will keep the momentum going over at Ulta. What are some examples of that innovation that have impressed you? Yeah. Um, so for a company, let's say like Elf, right, which has been pushing a lot in terms of concealers, highlighters, primers, that's the stuff that goes under your makeup to, to make it stay where you want it to stay um, at very attractive price points. That's been an area that's been really, really strong. Um, there's been a lot also in terms of the skinification of makeup. So products that sort of toe the line between the two categories. Those have been some pretty hot categories. And then in fragrance, um, you know, uh, su surprisingly, during COVID, fragrance took off. Uh, first started, obviously, in home. Um, people wanted a, a view in terms of self-expression, but um, but they weren't. Uh, so there was fragrance in the homes. And now um, you've seen a lot in terms of, of personal fragrances, perfumes and stuff. And that's really um, resonated. All right, Olivia, great conversation. Great preview of what to expect from Ulta after the close today. Our thanks to Olivia Tong over at Raymond James. And it's a really interesting conversation. Like Olivia said, I mean, beauty has been so resilient and it's mm -hmm. been kind of confounding. But I feel like we've been talking about small luxuries and how people want small luxuries maybe you some have to of these... treat yourself right exactly exactly and then uh beauty is skincare i've been seeing that a lot as well i also wonder how men will do because men's makeup has been a big thing or become a bigger thing like what will it look like as the consumer pulls back will men pull back on makeup as well i don't know men for uh makeup for men it's big in the tv business <laughs> i gotta say i wonder how we many see it daily how many of their sales uh are from bloomberg and the like but uh it'll be interesting to see anyway much more coming up this is the close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. We see stocks are mixed, bonds are down. So let's get a check on commodities as we head towards the close of commodities trading. Abigail Doolittle has more. A bit of a commodity uh, mixed picture here too. Scarlett, take a look at crude oil down 2.4% and a wild day for crude oil earlier, up more than 2% on the OPEC plus cuts. Uh, but now investors, traders seem to be reassessing that maybe that it's not enough to support crude oil. Now down WTI crude at $76 per barrel. Heating oil down in sympathy, also down about 2% down another day. To the upside, though, iron ore up 1%. Bernstein is very positive on the prospects for this fourth quarter. And wheat finding a gain for another day up 2.3%. There are supply concerns. However, when we put this into the picture of the year, well, it's just a little blip higher because on the year we have crude oil uh, dropping by, or excuse me, we have wheat down by uh, about 28% on the year, uh, the worst year, Scarlett, since 2008.
All right, keeping an eye on that one for sure. Abigail, thank you so much. Let's stay with agriculture commodities and broaden our focus to the health of the U.S. farming sector. The recent stopgap bill passed by Congress extends funding for farm programs and food assistance for one year. But lawmakers have yet to agree on the regular five-year farm bill. So joining us now is Tom Halverson. He is CoBank president and CEO. Tom, thanks for coming in today. Pleasure to be with you. So from where you sit, what is the primary program that needs to be prioritized in any five-year legislation? One year separate, being a separate issue and being resolved for now. Well, the, the, the issues are pretty similar over the course of time. Uh, and it's, we're de all deeply grateful for the, uh, the one-year extension, which pre creates some uh, predictability for farmers and ranchers and producers in the country to get to next year. Uh, the outlines broadly haven't been released, but we broadly know what they will contain. And, the, and by far the largest portion of the Farm Bill is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, which uh, is merely a, a debate over how many dollars to go into that. So uh, I am highly confident that the leaders in the House and Senate Agriculture Committee are working hard to uh, create the conditions in which they can produce a five-year bill uh, next year, and we're hopeful that they can. You're confident in Congress's ability to do its job? I, those are your words, not mine. <laughs> what I would say is on certain things, they seem to be better than on other things. But and more seriously, is there bipartisan? There is lines? happily one, uh, this uh, uh, rural policy in general, but the Farm Bill in particular is one of those places which frankly has experienced in the past and continues to experience more bipartisan support than just about any area of act other activity. And that's a, that's a very good thing for the country. And Tom, let's still talk a little bit about the farm economy, because I'm going through your notes, and I have to admit, I did not know this, that if you take a look at uh, the last couple of years, we're coming off two of the most profitable years in history. And that's surprising to me, because you think about the economy that we've had over the past two years in the general public, high inflation, high cost of everything, it feels like, and high borrowing costs. What's going on in the U.S. farm economy, and can it continue? Well, the, the farm economy, as you rightly say, net farm income had the two best years in history over the last two years. So we're in a process of what financial markets people might think of as mean reversion, mm -hmm. right? Net farm income is going to be off this year for the third year in a row, uh, but it'll still be a little bit above the, the trailing 20-year average, right? So conditions are actually pretty good. Uh, input prices have come down. Profit margins aren't as good as they were for the last two years. But if you look out over a 10 or 20 year time horizon, conditions are actually uh, pretty good. And we, we're pleased about that. Talk to us about how higher interest rates impact the farm economy, because we think about that and the way that we talk about it typically on Bloomberg television is from the perspective of companies tapping the debt markets, et cetera. But you think about uh, the, the costs that a farmer has to deal with. How much do higher interest rates in a particular year matter? Well, they matter, uh, right? The cost of money matters. But uh, uh, it's not like the leveraged finance market, okay? So the, the debt to equity ratio across the entire agricultural production economy is actually quite stable. There's about $3.6 trillion of equity value. Debt levels have been going up, but at a very stable relationship. And so the amount of equity to debt is still very, very robust. So uh, any uh, individual producer or agribusiness who has, uh, who has borrowings, and most do, you know, that's becoming more important. But as opposed to capital costs in a highly leveraged uh, corporation, for example, for most producers, they have a lot of other things that are higher up in their cost complex than interest, right? Uh, the cost of fertilizer, the cost of seeds, the cost of chemicals, the cost of labor. And so unless you're uh, extremely leveraged, uh, the cost of debt is becoming something you have to think about where it wasn't for quite a long time, uh, but it is not the driving force uh, on uh, profitability for most producers. What about the cost to protect against climate change? Because that's got to be something that has become more and more expensive and something that every farm needs to think about. Well, we are uh, actively involved at, at CoBank and with our colleagues in the farm credit system in discussions and dialogue with both producers and the agribusinesses that are our, our customers and owners about a variety of ways uh, to change the way that they produce to address the issues uh, that they see uh, that, their, that their customers uh, are presenting to them, whether it's big retailers, grocery chains, et cetera, who want to see changes in the way uh, crops are produced and the like, 
All of that amounts to a significant amount of incremental investing mm -hmm. that is required uh, the, to change the way crops get grown, you know, products get processed, uh, uh, and things of that nature. So, in fact, what we're seeing is, uh, is uh, a, a, an enormous wave of investment. Uh, and if you step aside uh, from agriculture for a minute, you know, there's been population growth for the last, uh, for the first time in a long time in rural America. And there is an en enormous wave of investment in, as you guys often talk about here, the energy transition, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So there, all of that stuff happens in rural places, right? All the food, all the fiber, all the water, all the power gets produced, generated, transported, originated in, in rural places. So there's a lot of investing activity going on, including uh, in the area that you just asked about. All right, Tom, got to leave it there. Really enjoyed this conversation, learned a lot. That is Tom Halverson. He is co-bank president and CEO. Now still all head on the close, the life and legacy of Henry Kissinger, who died yesterday at the age of 100. We'll speak with Jim Sabanius. He is professor at Harvard Business School. That's next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. We now turn to the legacy of Henry Kissinger, the German-born U.S. diplomat who died yesterday at the age of 100. He was a teenage refugee who rose to U.S. Secretary of State under President Nixon. Kissinger won praise for his role in opening China to the West and bringing about detente with the Soviet Union. But he also drew criticism for supporting massive bombing campaigns in Vietnam and Cambodia and backing the regime of Chile's Augusto Pinochet. So joining us now is Jim Sabanius. He is professor at Harvard Business School. Jim is author of the book Kissinger, The Negotiator, Lessons from Dealmaking at the Highest Level. Jim, it's good to speak with you. Thank you so much for, for talking with us. And I really want to hone in on this idea of Henry Kissinger as a master negotiator. How would you characterize his approach to negotiations? Because he definitely subscribed to the realpolitik doctrine. What was distinctive about his style at the time and even now? We had the pleasure, myself, uh, Bob Mnookin, Nick Burns, who's now the U.S. ambassador to China, of, uh, of interviewing all the former U.S. secretaries of state, along with many other great negotiators. And Kissinger really struck us as having a distinctive and powerful approach to negotiation. And I would say there are really five characteristics that, uh, that stand out across his negotiations with China, Russia over detente in the Middle East with disengagement agreements between Israel and Egypt and Syria, um, within the Paris negotiations and so forth. He sets clear long-term objectives. His negotiations are not moment to moment. Second, he doesn't just look at the negotiation by itself, but he has kind of a wide angle lens, a kind of a, a big picture view to say, what are the possible links and values of what may seem like separate negotiations and how they might be brought to bear on the issue and the particular negotiation at hand. Kissinger also thinks of negotiation not just as what you say at the table, mm -hmm. the sort of moves and counter moves tactically, but a lot of moves away from the table to set up the most promising possible situation, such that once you're at the table dealing with your counterpart, you're in the most advantageous possible position. Right. He also made a lot of moves to adapt to different circumstances. So you might have a strategic plan, but circumstances change, and he would change with them. The other piece I would say, the kind of final characteristic that cuts across these different deals is, um, is, is a reputation and a real focus on credibility. Mm -hmm. He just felt credibility is not divisible. If you don't keep your word or your commitments in one area, that'll have an effect on others. And we can talk about that in, you know, in different contexts, mm -hmm. but those are those are quite different from a very transactional negotiator or one who's focused only on the immediate issue and kind of drawing a circle around it. And by the way, great negotiators in business and finance as well have this characteristic. Right. Well, Jim, as you mentioned, I mean, you have the unique credential of having interviewed many, many secretaries of state, of course, spending time with Kissinger. How did Kissinger's negotiation tactics, his, uh, his policies, inform foreign policies for those that followed him? I think it kind of depended on who the negotiator was. 
because some of the negotiators were, you know, very tactical and focused on the immediate deal. Others, like uh, Jim Baker and his team, were very had had very much of a strategic view as well as a as well as a, a, a tactical focus. But something that I think is really striking, there were there are a group of academics who every year or so, about fifteen hundred of them who will focus on foreign policy, and international relations are asked to rate the secretaries of state over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And these are people, some of whom are liberal, some are conservative, many are middle of the road, but they're all over the political spectrum. Hands down, they continue to rate Kissinger as the most effective secretary of state. So each secretary of state who who followed Kissinger, and we interviewed all of them through, uh, through with the exception of Mike Pompeo, who we hope to do uh, subsequently, they all made reference to Kissinger. They all went to Kissinger for advice. It's uh, he, he really stands out, and you could see it even uh, even last summer, in July. He was in China, where he was treated as virtual royalty, meeting with uh, with Xi, and uh, just the sense that this is somebody whose insight is 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 really strong. Of course, yeah. he has many detractors, and you may even remember a, a debate in the Democratic primary in 2016 between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. And Hillary Clinton said, I would turn to Kissinger for advice mm -hmm. all the time. Bernie said, I wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole. He's a war criminal. And the, those are very, very strong views. He's a polarizing guy. My focus and my colleagues' focus was not so much to decide, was this guy a saint or a sinner, but rather, what can we learn from him about yes. really effective negotiation? Right. Yeah, he's certainly a giant in the world of U.S. diplomacy and someone whose insights uh, has informed U.S. policy for generations. Jim, really appreciate your joining us. Jim Sabanius is professor at Harvard Business School and, of course, author of the book uh, Kissinger. Kissinger. Thank the you. Negotiator. I'm looking for the title <laughs> Kissinger, the negotiating, the negotiator. Thank you so much. We've got more coming up on the legacy of Henry Kissinger. We're going to be joined by Richard Haas. He is Council on Foreign Relations President Emeritus. Coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. David Weston joins us now. David, we were just talking about the legacy of Henry Kissinger. You've got an expert guest to continue that conversation. Exactly. We're going to continue to reflect on the life and the legacy of Dr. Henry Kissinger. And we're joined now by Richard Haas. He's Counsel on Foreign Relations, President Emeritus, Centerview Partners, Senior Counselor, and author of the best-selling book, Bill of Obligations. So, Richard, you knew Henry well, I know. You have a piece out in Project Syndicate just today. And you talk, him, tell him, uh, talk about him in terms of the most preeminent sort of practitioner scholar that we've had in the role. Give us your sense of why he was so unique. He was that. He was the great scholar practitioner. We've had some other great secretaries of state, Dean Acheson, George Marshall, Jim Baker, more recently. Henry Kissinger is right up with any of them. But he brought an extra dimension to the job. He was steeped in history. He was a brilliant writer. So when he was doing the day-to-day -day of diplomacy, he had much more of a context that, that he could bring in, in managing, say, great power relations. He understood the importance of balance of power, what the, both the possibilities but also the limits of, of diplomacy. And I think that was Henry's great, great uh, ad advantage, David. He had such an effect, as you talk about in your piece, all around the world. At the same time, was his strength on some extent also his limitation? That is, he was a student of history, and he was a product of the disorder that came out of Nazi Germany when he fled Nazi Germany with his family. And as a result, order was really terribly important to him, maybe sometimes even at the price of justice. Oh, most definitely. Uh, Henry was a great believer in order. He was a conservative, so he kept his ambitions in check. So a lot of his foreign, a lot of his foreign policy was less about reaching for the stars than avoiding the worst. So he often didn't try to bring about peace. For example, uh, we'll get to this maybe in a minute after the '73 war in the Middle East. Rather than opting for peace, he was content to have a separate set of separation agreements. He didn't want to overreach because he was worried if he asked for too much, he would get nothing. Or in the case of uh, China or or Russia, Soviet Union, he didn't try to settle everything. 
He didn't often deal with internal matters like human rights. He had a fairly narrow approach, he said. Let's simply see if we can't agree on certain principles or rules of foreign policy. We're not going to try to solve anything with China. He never tried to solve Taiwan. The idea was to finesse the differences with the Soviet Union. You didn't have disarmament. You had arms control. It was a much more realistic, at times modest, approach to what foreign policy could accomplish. Let's pursue that question of what happened 50 years ago with the shuttle diplomacy in the wake of the Yom Kippur War, because now we have a war again in the region with some similarities and some differences. What, if anything, can we learn from what Henry Kissinger did to bring about, for example, the, the treaty between Egypt and Israel, which at the time was remarkable, nobody thought it could be done? What's similar and what's different? Uh, unfortunately, probably what's different is a little bit greater, David, but what's similar is what happened. In both cases, Israel was surprised, not so much because it didn't have intelligence, but because it didn't interpret it correctly. It turns out that assumptions and mindset are, are powerful tools that can often get in the way of seeing what's, what's there. I think though, there's some important differences, differences. Egypt in particular, under Anwar Sadat in 1973, waged war against Israel to, to make peace to recover Arab pride, to send Israel the message that it had to negotiate. Hamas waged war not to make peace, but to kill Jews, to, to hurt Israel, to demonstrate its standing in the Palestinian world. So I think that's one real difference. Hamas is not a, a potential partner. Uh, but Egypt and even Syria, to some extent, were. And that's the question here. Can Israel find partners to make peace? Will Israel be a partner for peace? And I think those are the big question marks right now, David. Will there be a Palestinian partner coming out of the West Bank, essentially some version of the Palestinian Authority that oversees it now? And second of all, will this generation of Israelis, after the trauma of October 7th, will they be willing to compromise for peace, to essentially coexist side by side not with the state of Egypt or some other country, but in this case, with the state of Palestine. And we're simply not there yet, but that's where we need to go. Richard, as you say, so much of what made Henry Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, came out of 19th century European politics and balance of power, to use your phrase, balance of power there. What role could that play here? It's somewhat different powers, but we have, of course, Egypt very much involved. You also have a Saudi Arabia that may be more active. It was somewhere around, I think, the periphery of 73, but it's very much in the center now. Oh, absolutely. Look, balance of power is essential because actors, nation states and others have to realize they won't be in a position to realize their ambitions through force. And therefore, they've got to think about other means such as diplomacy and maybe compromise. They won't be able to get everything they want. Hamas is not there, will probably never be there, but other Palestinians could well. Saudi Arabia is another example. For a long time, it wouldn't recognize Israel. Now it's clearly ready to. And I think Saudi Arabia here, David, could be really important. If they revive their peace initiative, which, by the way, getting in the way of was one of the motives for Hamas to do what it did on October 7th. But if the Saudis revive it and say, we're willing to make peace with you, Israel, but only on these conditions vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, then I think the Saudis, and probably working in tandem with the Biden administration, could trigger an interesting debate in Israel, essentially saying to the Israelis, do you want to have a greater peace one that brings in this important Arab and Islamic country, Saudi Arabia? Or do you want to have a greater Israel, a, t a country that's obsessed with its territorial reach? That's an important debate. I think it's probably an, an inevitable debate, right. Right. one that could in some ways divide this government from much of the country. And finally, Richard, in your piece uh, in Project Syndicate today, you say that he was not perfect. No person I've ever met is perfect, but there are a lot who will criticize Henry Kissinger for what, some of what happened sure. in Cambodia, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, in, in Chile. How should we understand the enormity of this legacy in light of some of the questions that have been raised about some places where maybe people didn't agree with the results? Look, the questions are, are legit. In some cases, I, I agree with the critics, particularly in Vietnam. Uh, I don't think there was a strong case for prolonging the war. I just don't think uh, the odds of victory were such that it made sense to make the enormous sacrifice that we uh, did. And I think that will be ultimately Kissinger's greatest uh, liability when it comes to his legacy. But all that said, including the cases you mentioned, East Pakistan or Bangladesh, Chile and the rest, where I think Henry did some questionable things, on balance, the opening to China, the stabilization of uh, relations with a nuclear Soviet Union, the buildings of the foundations for Middle East peace, those are extraordinary accomplishments. And I think history will be pretty generous towards Dr. Kissinger as a result.
Richard, thank you so very much for joining us on this very special day. That's Richard Haas. He's Counsel and Foreign Relations President Emeritus and author of the book Bill of Obligations. On Friday, we're going to be joined by Larry Summers, former U.S. Treasury Secretary, to talk about open AI as well as what he knew about Henry Kissinger and, and as well Charlie Munger. That's on Wall Street Week at 6 p.m. New York time on Friday. Scarlett? All right. Thank you so much, David. Looking forward to that, of course. We've got a lot more coming up on the close, but as we head towards the one-hour mark before the closing bell, you could see yields are moving higher. That is a decline in Treasuries, uh, pushing yields up. Despite data, Katie, that basically shows what we expected. The U.S. economy is slowing down, things are cooling, and the Fed's campaign of rate hikes might look like it's coming to an end. And you can see that reflected in the Treasury market as well. Uh, Two-year yields up a little bit, so too our 10-year yields. All right, we'll continue to keep an eye on the developments here as uh, U.S. equities move slightly higher. The S&P 500 in the green at the moment, the Dow adding to its advance. This is the close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And taking a look at where markets stand right now, Katie, this marks the seventh day of the S&P 500 moving less than half of 1%. Yeah, it has been really boring out there. Volume has been pretty light as well. Of course, it feels like we're in maybe a little bit of a holding pattern. I know that we're waiting on the Fed, but we still have earnings. We still have Fed speak, and yet this market not really budging that much. Yeah, you see the two-year yield moving up uh, about six and a half basis points. It started the week at 4.94%, so it's been a pretty big move for this week so far. You see crude oil down by 2.2%. Disappointment that the OPEC Plus production cuts were fairly modest. Some people saying they lack teeth, and the dollar moving a bit higher by four tenths of one percent but for the month it's set to close down about three percent yeah there you go and then you have the uh bloomberg dollar moving higher as well maybe a little bit of a haven bid going on just four tenths of a percent all right let's take a look at my favorite chart for this month and this is really about the big banner month that we've seen in bonds uh it's been quite the move here because if you look at it uh the ag which is the benchmark for the u.s bond market it includes what treasuries agency and mortgage debt up almost 5%, 4.9% for the me best month since the 1980s. It's pretty amazing, too, and you think about just how quickly uh, these narratives can shift. It really feels like if you look towards the right end of that chart that things have been getting more volatile to the yeah. upside and the downside. But let's go back to the equity market because we do have some uh, interesting movers to talk about. I want to start with Tesla because it's Cyber Thursday. We finally get the Cyber Truck. That is uh, the long-awaited Cyber Truck. Two years behind schedule. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's not really helping out the stock right now. Tesla shares down 1%. Of course, Elon Musk made some interesting comments at uh, the DealBook conference yesterday. Maybe that's what's filtering through into the stock. Tesla has become this strange proxy for just the man, Elon Musk. But it'll be interesting to see the reception of the Cybertruck. We should get details on its price configurations and battery range today. So uh, a lot to look forward to there. Let's also talk about Ford, a legacy automaker. They restored financial guidance today, uh, saying profits would come in lower than expected after, of course, that six-week strike. Yeah. We heard something similar from GM yesterday. But GM gave investors a big sweetener with an accelerated share buyback program and then also uh, a 33% increase in its dividend. We didn't get that from Ford. No, no, no such luck when it comes to Ford. And uh, you can really see that in the share prices. And then let's also talk about Snapchat. We talked about that this a little bit in top calls earlier, but you had Jeffries come out and upgrade both Snapchat and Pinterest, but it was fun with Snapchat. He said that the Snapchat upgrade, Snap rather, is a more controversial call as it's driven by the belief that the stock re-rates higher on North American revenue growth, re-accelerating. Uh, so I don't know, a lot, of, a lot of hope and dreams, but Snap currently up about, what, 6%. All those North American teenagers uh, on their Snapchat. They love, they love social media. They love social media. They spend a lot of time there. There's a lot of advertising to be done on Snapchat. All right, we're less than one hour away from the closing bell. We've got cross-platform coverage of today's top stories, beginning right now with our colleagues in Bloomberg Radio. Keep here. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. 
This is the countdown to the close. Scarlett Boo and Katie Greifeld here. Remain Bossick has a day off. We are joined now by our colleagues Carol Masser and Jess Menton. And of course, we welcome in full our Bloomberg audiences across television, radio, YouTube, and originals. Good to see you, Carol. Hello. What are you guys keeping your eyes on? I mean, it's certainly not the market because it feels pretty <laughs> meh in terms of price action. Right. It's kind of a real thing, meh, this meh thing. Although it's been a great month for yes. stocks as we wrap up. But I agree. And I feel like as economic data continues to come out, we hear from Fed speakers, I like all these different stories that kind of remind us that we are getting back to our post-pandemic world. And I look at something like something near and dear to me, boating, but boat sales, I actually bought a boat during the pandemic, <laughs> looking to kind of get out and feel like, how could you do it like in a safe way? Boat sales soared during the pandemic. Well, now we're talking at numbers now, maybe estimated to reach a decade low. Mm. So again, it's another victim of higher interest rates. If you're trying to finance something like that, it's going to cost you a lot more to do. And so we are seeing certainly a pullback, kind of a reset post-pandemic, Jess. I always enjoy, Carol, when you do share <laughs> those boat pictures on uh, Twitter, ra X rather, as you call it. I don't know what I always love it, but especially when you're thinking about inflation, some of those higher rates weighing on those discretionary purchases. But it is interesting to see kind of where we've come and gone, obviously, since the peak of the pandemic and where we are now. And of course, we talk about boats. We talk about uh, ways of getting around. Uh, Katie, Lanes, trains, been, and automobiles. Yeah, you've been obsessed <laughs> with Cybertruck, or at least talking about the long-anticipated. She's obsessed. Yes, months, yeah, let's, the let's, Cybertruck. Let's get some pictures up for our TV audience of that Cybertruck, because uh, as I said to Scarlett earlier, it's Cyber Thursday. It is the long-awaited release of this Cybertruck. It's two years behind schedule, of course. Uh, keeping but, track. I mean, take a look at it. It's huge. It's difficult to make. Uh, it's finally coming to the market. Market. Uh, we are expected to hear from the company uh, details when it comes to its price, its configurations, and its battery range today. Uh, of course, this is part of an event at Tesla's Austin headquarters, a live stream launch event starting at 2 p.m. local time. So should be starting pretty soon. I am really interested to see how this is actually received, how many they actually produce, and how many they actually sell. You guys realize that you can customize it, right? It's stainless steel, so you can get these wraps um, and apply it to the car's exterior, and you can what, get, neon. I don't know, camouflage, neon, whatever Camouflage, you want. that's pretty cool. Yeah, $50,000 starting price. Somehow, yeah. I think, you know, you throw in a few extras, it's going to go way above that, but we will see, we will see, but what's interesting is you're going to have to be patient, right? Because yeah. in terms of ramping up production, folks, it's going to take a while. Uh, Elon Musk saying just last month they could ramp up to a rate of 250,000 vehicles a year by sometime in 2025. That's not very many. No. Yeah. And we know how Elon is when it comes to projections. They kind of move around a little bit. It's Squishy. a concept. It's a, yeah. con it's a, it's a yeah. concept. Just want to point out that event is in Austin, Texas, my, my homeland there. There you go. <laughs> but obviously that Cybertruck being delayed behind about a two years there. So interesting to see how all this shapes up moving forward. And it's a far cry from what's going on with Tesla vehicle sales overall, yeah. uh, which has really dropped off. And Tesla has had to cut prices for those vehicles. And it, it, the repercussions for the other automakers are that mm -hmm. everyone is cutting prices and sales have really, really slowed down. Just to focus on the truck a little bit more. So uh, it's a Obsessed. pickup truck. <laughs> it's a pickup truck. There is a bed there somewhere. When it oh, there it is again. It looks awesome. What is uh, it that you like so much about this puppy? I feel Please like if it looks like if a teenage boy, like like drew a picture of a truck yeah. and then that drawing <laughs> became a real life truck that's what it would it be it looks like it comes from minecraft yeah, yeah it's like very like dystopian if i if it was the end of the world i would want to be driving that truck it's kind of like, what was the vehicle in Back to the Future? Yes, the I'm getting those the Back DeLorean to the Future vibes. on steroids, yes. right? Or <laughs> with even less angles, if you will, or it more angles. It doesn't run on the flux capacitor, though. It doesn't run. <laughs> How do you know that? That's How do true. you know that? Got a fact check. It's, ele it's an electric vehicle. All right, guys, we're going to be watching for some headlines uh, when they finally roll out. I'm curious who gets those first cars, right? It must be some of those. Tesla devotees. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll certainly bring you any headlines that come on Tesla. And we will be back in less than an hour. We're going to wrap up, who knew, the month of November, just kind of flying by. Uh, Beyond the Bell, join us at 4 p.m. Wall Street time. All right, we continue the market's coverage here on the close. And after the everything rally that we've seen this month, Carol just mentioned it, what is the outlook for 2024? Here with her view now is Lisa Shallett. She is Chief Investment Officer over at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Lisa, it is good to see you. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us here. I guess when it comes to the markets, the big question is how much is this everything rally in both risky assets across equities and fixed in income driven by FOMO versus 
fundamentals and therefore how does that put us in position for 2024? Well, look, I definitely think that there's an element of fundamentals that have underpinned this retracement uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the correction that we had between July and the end of October. Uh, but the reality is, is that, you know, we are still below those July highs. So what's happened is, is that financial conditions have eased. Uh, and so I think, you know, markets have responded uh, you know, reasonably to that improvement in the liquidity backdrop. All that having been said, however, to your point, um, we, we've had this rally that now in many ways is, is dependent on a narrative of soft landing, a narrative of a rebound in corporate profit growth next year, and what I call the immaculate uh, soft landing, meaning no real impacts uh, to the labor market, uh, and yet the Fed uh, is going to be cutting rates. So it's kind of the, the, the priced for perfection type of market. Uh, and with little room for error, uh, we worry about execution risk in uh, 2024, and we're kind of calling it the show me year, mm. right? The Fed's got to show us that they're going to actually cut, which, you know, we're not sure they're actually going to do. And corporates have to show uh, that they're actually going to be able to grow profits without firing people. Yeah, no, all important points. The rate cut, and I'm glad you bring that up because I can't get my head around it. If you're anticipating a soft landing, under what circumstances would the Federal Reserve need to cut interest rates? What are the necessary pieces for rate cuts that policymakers need to see before they start moving in that direction? Yeah, you know, we've in, been engaging in a lot of selective hearing and selective listening when it comes to the Fed speakers. Uh, but I, I feel, you know, that, that the Fed has been clear. They are looking for material economic slowing. They're looking for an uptick in unemployment. Uh, all together with this uh, deceleration in inflation. I think this idea that inflation alone uh, is going to prompt the Fed to cut is, uh, is, you know, kind of hope over reality. Hope over reality. So let's say that the Fed does execute higher for longer, that they stay on hold at terminal for the foreseeable future. What does that mean for the equity market, for markets overall? Where does that leave you wanting to be positioned right now? Yeah, so we've been um, pretty clear on this. Is it, Our perspective is that uh, this is a market that at the cap-weighted index level, at that S&P 500 index level, uh, we're going to continue to be range-bound uh, in this narrow band between 4,100 and 4,800, as we have been, quite frankly, for the past two years. Um, and that's probably going to continue. But underneath the surface, of this market cap weighted index, which as we know has been dominated by the magnificent seven, those seven names that have kind of driven 80% of the returns, uh, there are lots of things to do. And so next year, if in fact uh, the Fed does end up uh, you know, cutting rates, um, that's gonna be very good for many of the sectors that have been quote unquote down and out this year. Uh, cyclical-oriented sectors, value-oriented sectors, uh, things like uh, uh, financial services, things like industrials uh, should really benefit in that type of environment. Well, let's talk about the different market caps as well, because, of course, the story of 2023, and maybe we've started to broaden out a little bit in the last month, but the story has really been these large mega cap tech companies in particular. But just focusing on size, do you see that broaden out maybe into the mid caps, maybe into the small caps? I, I think that we will. And I think that we can under two scenarios, right? On the one hand, if economic growth is much, much better, uh, then I think that, that we will see breadth improve in the market uh, and that the rising tide will lift all the boats. Alternatively, if economic growth is really deteriorating uh, at a faster pace than what is currently discounted, uh, then as we get into a recessionary or more of a hard landing, uh, that's really when you'd want to go and buy, uh, you know, some very cheap, uh, you know, deep 
deep cyclicals and, and things of that nature. So either way, I do think 2024 is going to be a year uh, of stock picking, a year of active management, uh, a year of broadening underneath uh, the base of, of the index. You talk about investors looking for some deep cyclical plays. Are we going to see companies do that as well? Do you anticipate a pickup in M&A as the economy slows further? Yeah, you know, Scarlett, I think this is such a key point. Um, uh, you know, when you look at what's gone on in some of the private markets and the private equity markets and the private credit markets, uh, and then you compare that to what's gone on in terms of the bloodbath in public small caps, uh, it's really staggering. And our guess is that if you look at the comparison in valuations now, uh, that many private equity firms, many strategic corporate deals, some of the private credit folks uh, may start seeing real opportunities to work with public small cap companies. And so we do think that the M&A uh, environment is going to improve, that there's going to be this loosening uh, of, of the lock, that, that some of the private market is going to take some of those, quote unquote, marks, mm -hmm. mark things to market. Uh, and that's going to create uh, a little bit of a loosening in the transaction uh, environment. Lisa Shallot, great conversation. Appreciate your time. That is Lisa Shallot. She is Chief Investment Officer over at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Now coming up, we'll take a look at why the explosive growth of multi-manager funds such as Ken Griffin Citadel are raising concerns among regulators and investors. And we got to mention earnings season isn't over yet. We're going to hear from Dell, Ulta Beauty and Marvell Technology after the bell. We'll give you the results as soon as they cross. And we'll take a look at the far reaching impact of ChatGPT one year after it was officially released by OpenAI. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. About 40 minutes to go until those closing bells. You take a look at a market right now that is pretty much unchanged, a little bit lower, but there are some individual movers to talk about. You look at what's doing well right now. Salesforce is your biggest points contributor to the S&P 500 right now, to the upside. United Health doing well as well. So too is AbbVie, of course. Uh, some interesting M&A news around that name that we'll get to a little bit later. That's the good news. You take a look at what's not doing too well. Of course, you have Tesla right behind me, and then you have Amazon, Meta, Alphabet. A lot of tech names today and NVIDIA as well, of course, not doing too hot today. But overall, a pretty quiet day. So let's get into the options space because it's time now for Options Insight. And we want to get you up to speed with the day's options trading. Abigail Doolittle's been taking a look at the VIX and everything else. Abigail, take it away. Well, Katie, you know, this November, as everybody's been saying, in November to remember the best month for the S&P 500, up about 8.5%. Going back to July of 2022, the SOX, the NASDAQ 100, the Russell 2000, all of these indexes participating as bonds rally too. And of course, the VIX and some of these other volatility indexes, super, super suppressed. Let's bring in uh, Samantha LaDuke, founder of LaDuke Trading. And Samantha, let's start off with this stock rally because when I take a look at any chart, there is a pattern of up, down, up, down, up, down, uh, these ranges. And if we had been talking about a month ago, the sky was falling. Now everybody's exuberant, which tells me that nobody really is all that certain. Lots of uncertainty. Do you think that December can uh, put up such a banner month as well? Well, I have a definite hesitation on that. But first, let's talk about that time that we talked a month ago. It was actually my thesis was um, that the dollar yen would actually see intervention at that 152 level. And if they did, in fact, uh, that would cause a stay of uh, in the advance of both dollar and yields. They have since fallen strongly. It would also put a bottom in uh, equities and bonds. And as you just mentioned, SPY had its best you know, November in 100 years. VIX is at four-year lows. Um, and bonds even rose 15% off the bottom. So it was a very, very special November. But um, where we are now is VIX is definitely on the ground and it bears watching um, this outlier event that happened with VIX uh, for a move higher. So I think December we'll see more chop. Specifically, we have 
um, a lot less of a tailwind. We had 100 billion in corporate buybacks. That you know, blackout window starts December 8th. We had CTAs, which are more price insensitive buyers, to the tune of about 100 billion. Also, um, they are running out of steam. We also had the QRA, the quarterly refunding announcement by Yellen on the first. At right. the same time, the Fed paused, and that actually infused liquidity into the markets. Yes. All of that is now diminishing. So well, it's time for VIX to reappear. Yeah. Well, you know, another piece of this, it seems to me with this big rally this month that a lot of traders are pricing in a true Fed pivot, and yet we don't really have that confirmation from the Fed uh, themselves. The dot plot, of course, does suggest next year they'll uh, be cutting, but it could come in December, and Fed Chair Jay Powell uh, and some of the other members of the Fed have suggested that uh, cutting may not happen for a while. If uh, that turns out to be true, that they uh, reiterate higher for longer, what does that do to volatility? Is it a slow move higher, or is it a spike higher, and then a, a move yeah. down from stocks? Yeah, I don't see the higher for longer at all. I've been on this show a few times and I've said I'm very adamant that the Fed would pause back in March and they would step down and then pause. And in fact, I am absolutely seeing a cut by March. Not this December, absolutely not, but by March for sure. And not necessarily the narrative of economic slowdown or that they beat inflation, um, but necessarily just that they need to help prevent a hard landing for all the companies and such that need to refinance. So I think they're actually, the market has already front run this cut. So debating it all is basically helping the yields fall with the dollar and the stocks and bonds get bid. But volatility is extremely oversold. And I think that that bears watching, especially with the FANG stocks being at, you know, price to perfection again. And this oversold uh, rally in value looking more and more interesting into the new year. Uh, golden miners participating, yen coming up off the ground. Uh, it's, it's very telling in regards to how oversold VIX is too, which we can kind of touch on. But that's that's my baseline bet. I think we're going to head down to that 4,500 at least for SPX by December. Yeah, and uh, speaking of the VIX, the VIX curve is uh, pretty impressive, again, going uh, much higher into 2024. And here is value versus growth. Value not doing so well. Looking for that bid higher. Let's see whether or not 2024 brings it. Samantha LaDuc, founder of LaDuc Trading, thanks so much for joining us for Options Insight today and for all of your perspective. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Well, the app that thrusts large language models into the spotlight turns one year old today. Of course, talking about OpenAI's chat GPT, and the occasion comes amid Sam Altman's reinstatement as OpenAI CEO following a tumultuous battle about his leadership at the company, uh, if you want to call it that. But what, reading some of the articles about the birthday of chat GPT, this stat really stuck out to me that OpenAI says that 100 million people use ChatGPT every week. Scarlett, that is so many. Yeah, but two of them don't, and we're sitting right here. I know. <laughs> so I've not qualified. been tempted yet, but I don't even use Siri, so you know, yeah. I'm not in the habit of doing this. Yeah, I mean, I talk to Alexa, but it's mostly to ask her what the weather is. She's yeah. not exactly a chat GPT level, but yeah, I feel, I mean, it is amazing in a lot of ways to think that it's only been a year, uh, given that it's occupied so much of conversation. It sucks up the oxygen. It's part of the zeitgeist. You see New Yorker cartoons on it. Yes. So like, it's very much part of everything. I'm willing to bet that a large portion of that 100 million are high school boys <laughs> <laughs> writing their high school papers. See, that is so crazy to me. I hope for the sake of humanity that uh, that's, that's not, not the, the case. case, that really they're doing the work and they're writing their essays. Maybe, high school boys. maybe that was the concern of the open AI board. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Among other things. I would love to know uh, if anyone's watching there. But uh, yeah, I feel like we're still very much in the phase of figuring out what the ultimate applications will be for normal people because it is fun, to, of course, to, I guess, chat to a chat bot. But is it though? Uh, not really. I'm not sure it's all that rewarding. Doesn't really get me going. This is the close on Bloomberg. This is The Close on Bloomberg, and we want to take you now to Austin, Texas, where Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, is 
talking. And uh, of course, this is, uh, what do you it call it? Cyber Thursday? Cyber Thursday? Cyber Thursday, baby. Yeah, because uh, they are delivering cyber trucks finally, about it's, two years behind schedule. And um, these vehicles, if we can show a picture of it, he, he's have, taking uh, up the screen right now, but Boy, they look kind of Blade Runner-esque. They <laughs> look really boxy. They're yeah. supposed to be really modern. Um, and of course, there aren't that many that are being delivered right now. But this is a huge moment for the company because Elon Musk has been promising up this cyber truck and it's going to be a new line of revenue for the company uh, at a time when EV sales are slowing down overall. And it's their first foray into pickup trucks, which is really interesting because, of course, the pickup truck market, especially in the U.S., uh, hugely popular vehicles. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting test of the waters for demand for pickup trucks produced by Tesla. Uh, and you can see the yeah. Cybertruck there. Definitely not your typical pickup truck. They're uh, throwing things at it. And we know it the last like time they did that, it didn't work out too well. <laughs> looks like uh, maybe the windows are staying intact. So, so that's a good the, sign. The uh, but yes, this is a live stream launch event uh, that I believe that we're watching. And I heard a little bit so, of him speaking. He said that finally the future will look like the future or something like that. So a little bit dystopian, but it's definitely a I'm, moment. I'm glad you used that word dystopian because when you just look at the profile of the car or the vehicle, it doesn't really look like a pickup truck the yes. way that Ford F-150 does. And now that you can see that the back is open, there is a bed there. It's, I guess, it, a little, it resembles a pickup truck a little bit more, but... Yeah. It's yeah. definitely a unique look. I mean, you think about an F-150, uh, the iconic F-150, and then you take a look at the Cybertruck. It's definitely different, so got to give them credit for that. We'll see uh, if that has mass appeal. Of course, like Scarlett said, they're not producing very many, but as you can see there, some shots of the Cybertruck. It really let's, does look like it's out of Minecraft. Anyway. I, would, I could talk about this for hours, but let's shift gears here and talk about multi-manager funds, such as Ken Griffin's Citadel. They've come to dominate the hedge fund industry, but the explosive growth of these funds has led industry giants to pile into many of the same trades. Now that is triggering concern among regulators, investors, and traders. For more, we're, blue, we're joined by Bloomberg's hedge fund reporter, Hema Parmer, and talk to us a little bit about the real worry here. Is it basically just that crowding effect and what that could mean? Yeah, there's a few things that have coalesced right now that we're seeing that's prompting a lot of this concern. These hedge funds, their multi-manager funds, they've grown in size so much. They've Some of them have doubled in size in just the past couple of years in terms of assets under management. You're seeing it overlapping in the kind of trades that they do, more crowding into certain sorts of um, trades. And then you're seeing leverage as well, too, on certain trades. And so what the concern is, is that if there's a deleveraging event, if there's some sort of situation, like a pandemic or otherwise, that prompts market um, chaos and these funds need to exit these stakes, could we see them all having to exit at the same time and it being a domino effect? That's mm. quite concerning. Yeah, a sort of concerted rush for the ex exits. Yes. I could see that being a bit of a pain. But talk to us a little bit about what we're talking about. Pod yes. shops. Feels like that's a term that has really become more popular in the past year or so. When we're talking about pod shops, who are we actually talking about? Yes, so pod shops refers to multi-manager platforms. Basically, it's these hedge funds that trade a lot of money, um, but they use these pods. So it'll be individual teams that trade across different assets, um, usually without talking to each other. Um, and uh, they, so like a portfolio manager will have an analyst and it'll be a small team of people. Mm -hmm. And so each individual pod trades independently and those returns feed into the fund as a whole. Um, and so that's different from say a fund where, you know, it's, it's one big team that works together. So investors in that fund only see one set of numbers, uh, the aggregate returns of everything yes. all combined. One of the trades that people are really concerned about, you mentioned crowded trades, is the basis trade. And of course, that's between the cash treasury market and the futures treasury market. Um, that's the one that's really concerning. Talk to us a little bit about regulator, what regulators have said and what Ken Griffin has said about this as well, because Citadel is one of those firms with a lot of pot shops. Yes. So um, the basis trade has been very much on the radar. It's a concern because of what we saw in March 2020, mm -hmm. where it's a trade that requires a great deal of leverage for it to work. And it's a trade that generally is fine. But when the markets turn against you in a surprising way, it can backfire. And that's what we saw in March 2020, and when the Fed came in to essentially save a lot of the players. And so that's concerning moving forward in that if that happens again, um, what could that mean? And so we're seeing regulators be more vocal about it. Um, the fund side, 
uh, you're seeing the funds, you know, thinking, well, we're providing liquidity to the market. This is a point that Ken Griffin has made, mm -hmm. that these funds are important players in the market, providing this liquidity, doing good, um, and that the regulatory concern may be misguided. All right, Hema, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Hema Parmar writing about these pod shops. And of course, you can find that story on the Bloomberg terminal. Let's go back to Austin for a moment here because uh, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, is talking a little bit more as the company delivers its first Cybertrucks today. Let's listen in. Sled. And uh, when we went to the track, we said, well, well what's the best uh, yeah, that, that you've seen? I said, well, it's, it'd be the fourth uh, F-350 diesel. It was like, well, let's, let's put our truck up against that. So the, the guy who runs the, the truck pool said, there's no way. There's no way. It's like, well, let's try it. Let's see what happens. listening in to that uh, Tesla Austin Texas event we know that today is the launch the first deliveries of the Cybertruck you're taking a look at this presentation here I believe Musk introduced it as they put their Cybertruck up against uh, some of these diesel pickup trucks on the track and uh, that's what we were looking at there uh, looks like uh, you know again an event that we know this is the live stream launch there's a yeah, lot of buzz around these cyber trucks given that we've had to wait two years let's listen in a little bit more to Elon Musk car that is uh, you know um, bullet, bullet tough uh, you know like that phrase TM um, <laughs> and uh, can out pull an f-350 diesel uh, has a massive towing capacity massive bed uh, one of, it, it's basically an incredibly useful truck. It, it's not just some grandstanding showpiece like me. Um, uh, it, it's actually, it's actually very useful. <laughs> now, what about performance? So this, I should say, it, it has an adaptive air suspension. So no matter what the load is, uh, you, it will, you can always have the, it can set the, the ride height at any, at, at low height, anything. It'll automatically adjust the damping according to uh, how much load it's carrying and the road conditions. Uh, it has a 17 inch ground clearance. Now, that's a true 17 inches. The, it, with, typically with a truck, you'll, you'll get the differential hanging down low, uh, the rear differential, and that's to what you'll high side on a rock. Uh, but this is this has a completely flat bed, so you could you could uh, drive over basically anything. We actually uh, did, took the Cybertruck on a, a Baja rally drive, so this is insane off-road capability. It has locking differentials, rear torque vectoring, uh, and the crazy thing is, it'll do this all in comfort. Um, it has steer by wire, which is if, if, it's one of the things where most people don't know what that means, but um, it's, what, it's how modern jets are designed, the steer-by-wire, which, which gives you variable gain. So you, if you turn the wheel, a small, the, steering, the steering yoke, a small amount in the parking lot, it will turn the wheels a lot. But if you, if you turn it on, on a highway, it turns the wheels a small amount. So it, it dynamically adjusts how, how much the wheels turn according to uh, what your speed is. Um, and this actually makes it very easy to drive. It actually, and it has a turning circle less than a Model S. So this thing can pack, practically turn it, you know, rotate on a, you know, dime basically. Um, it has incredible low speed maneuverability. And then uh, there's a lot of advanced details under the skin. Uh, it's the first time that a car is moving to a 48 volt a uh, low voltage architecture from 12 volts, which has been around for 100 years. Um, we have Ethernet comms, uh, distributed controllers, allows for 70% less wire in the car. Um, and it's, uh, 
it's really the, the, the internals are as advanced as the externals. It's, it's a, a whole new step change in the technology. So let's take it to the racetrack and see how, how does the Cybertruck perform against the Porsche 911. And I, sh I should say, this is, this is an actual Porsche. It's, we literally just got it from the dealer. 2023 Porsche 911. are watching the live stream of the Cybertruck uh, show, in a way, uh, and this is, of course, the Cybertruck facing off against, or racing, but I should wait, say, a Porsche, right? A Porsche 911. Porsche 911, thank you, Katie. Looks like the Cybertruck won. And it does. Um, <laughs> Ed Ludlow, our resident tech expert, uh, Bloomberg Technology co-host, joins us right now. Ed, this is quite the show that Elon Musk is putting on here. How popular are these Cybertrucks? What do we know about the orders outstanding for these vehicles? Yeah, look, like, like all electric vehicles that come to market, there was a huge pre-order base, right, where at first you'd front up $100 to get on the pre-order wait list. They actually recently raised that pre-order to 250 But, you know, it, it's a cutting-edge new technology, right? Elon Musk was just talking about, as you heard, it's the highest voltage EV they've ever made. It's going to take a really long time to ramp to volume production. So they're supply constrained. The wait list is very long. Musk reckons 250,000 units maybe by 2025. What you're going to see today is just the first few units that rolled off the production line go to, I am sure, some very VIP customers. And so this is Tesla's first entry into the pickup truck market in the U.S. Uh, but you think right. about who dominates the EV pickup trays are market or who, you know, at least is very well represented. I think of Ford. I think of the F-150 Lightning. Are the buyer base of the F-150 Lightning going to, you know, come over and actually embrace the Cybertruck? Who's buying this? So the vast majority of vehicles that Americans buy, as an example, is in the light truck category. The pickup truck is sacred in America. And on the electric uh, side, it's dominated by Ford's F-150 Lightning, as you said, but also the Rivian R1T. And most of Musk's presentation for the last 10 minutes or so has been giving a side-by-side -side comparison of the performance of Cybertruck relative to Ford's F-150 Lightning. It basically has double the ground clearance. It has superior towing capacity, 11,000 pounds on the Cybertruck relative to the F-150 Lightning's uh, 10,000 pounds. It can carry a higher uh, mass of payload. Uh, and as Musk just demonstrated in that drag race, where it wasn't just drag racing a Porsche 911, it was also towing one on the back while oh drag racing a Porsche 911. It oh, can do wait, zero to six. <laughs> right, and exactly. And Ed, go ahead, go ahead, guys. Uh, I was going to say, I mean, uh, looking at some of the headlines crossing the terminal, You're Tesla just, uh, saying that the Cybertruck goes from zero to 60 miles an hour in 2.6 seconds. So uh, it's pretty fast for a truck. But pretty Musk fast. has talked about how, quote, insanely difficult this vehicle is to produce. We know that this must have been a challenge, given that uh, we're about two years late here. Yeah, so take the design of the truck, for example. This Tesla designed reinforced stainless steel. The reason for the angularity on the design is simply put, you cannot stamp press that steel. It has to be that shape because you can't change it otherwise. All of this is really exciting, guys. But remember, I was there in 2019 in Hawthorne, Los Angeles. What we were promised was a starting price range, 39,000 US dollars to just up under 70,000 at that time based on a range of specs. We have no idea what the range of this vehicle is yet, and we don't know what the pricing is. And that's going to be really important because basically Musk has front run this. He spent two years talking about how challenging it's been to design and how difficult it's going to be to produce. And in that time, we've gone through a pandemic globally. And so you'd imagine from a supply chain and cost-based perspective, if and when we find out during this event, it's probably going to be a much more expensive product yeah. than first touted in 2019. I look forward to seeing these cyber trucks in the parking lots of Home Depot and Lowe's and see um, what people are actually going to put in the flatbed there. What do we know about, I mean, granted, there, there are not that many uh, models that will well, be delivered see, about, initially. About what do we know here. about what this does to the so. financials of Tesla, Ed? 
Well, uh, as with all models, you reach uh, positive margin or unit profitability based on volume. And that's why it's so important to reiterate the forecast that Musk has given. Maybe 250,000 units by 2025. These are just the first few individual units or does. I'm trying to work out who's getting in these things. I think I just saw Alexis Ohanian get in one. Huh. Forgive me for that, that little pivot No, that's there. good to know because yeah. we didn't know who was getting them. Right, exactly. So we don't have a good... Uh, uh, also, keep an eye out for Joe Rogan. I'm, I'm pretty confident that he'll be there getting one as we well. We've got to get a guest but that, list. But that, that's the thing, right? It's just unit economics, volume economics, and that is the trouble with this uh, high-cost bill of materials, mm -hmm. high-cutting-edge technology product that until they ramp, it's going to be a bit of a drag on the bottom line. Right. Well, Ed Ludlow, really appreciate you sticking by. Still ahead on the close. We're counting it down to the closing right, bill. Hey. Nancy Tangler, Laffer Tangler, CEO and CIO. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to close. I'm Katie Greifeld alongside Scarlett Fu. And about 10 minutes ago, and it's another quiet day on Wall Street. It's another quiet day. I checked, and the last time the S&P 500 has closed more than 1% higher or lower was November 14th. So this is now the seventh straight day of moving less than half of 1%. We're mm -hmm. keeping that uh, idea of the November rally losing some steam going here uh, on this final trading day of the month. Well, uh, let's get into it now with Nancy Tengler. Uh, she, of course, is Laffer Tengler, CEO and CIO. And I want to bring you in on that stat, Nancy, the fact that if you look over the past week or so, it's been very, very quiet when it comes to the equity market, a little bit more action in the bond market. But what do you make of that? Are we really just breathing a sigh of relief here? Or do you think this is a calm before a storm? Well, Katie, I think, you know, we get so conditioned to see, you know, the market go up and then we just want to continue to see it go up. But in fact, these pauses are good for stocks to, to regroup, uh, in, in this case, to expand the breadth of, of the rally. Uh, I do think we continue to go higher through the end of the year. And then 2024 will start afresh and we'll have a whole new host of issues and questions. And uh, then, then we can, you know, take a look again. But I, I would just point out that the market on average uh, has a correction uh, once every 12 months, if you go back and look historically. So this pause, in my view, is good. We had a huge run up in November. Uh, and, and I think we, we are deserving of a pause. So I'm not troubled by it. Deserving of a pause. What do you think breaks the lull here? Of course, we are heading into the end of the year. Uh, volume expected to come down a little bit, uh, of course. But you think between economic data, you think between the Fed, you think about corporate fundamentals. I mean, what is going to take over as the real driver of this market? Well, I think I think interest rates and the Fed, which have been the drivers, um, we we have have tur we turned our attention as a, as a group, investors did, to earnings uh, last month, and now what we're seeing is there's a lack of of you know catalysts. So it will be Fed speak, it will be interest rates, it will be the auctions. People will be parsing every single piece of data between now and the end of the year. But because we invest for the next three to five years. We will be using this, this pause, uh, if we get more of a correction early in December, we'll be using it to add to the names we want to hold for the next three to five years. And Nancy, your firm, of course, manages a, a fund that tries to manage inflation risk in the United States. So clearly you have a take on where you see inflation headed. Uh, we got data today that shows year over year the PCE uh, core is at about 3.5% right now. That's better, but we're not at that 2% level that the Fed is so, so fixated on. How are you positioning in terms of inflation? Well, Scarlett, I, I have written also a piece that um, argues that this market is analogous to the 1990s when we actually had yields between 5 to 8 percent. And I should point out, not only was I alive, but I was managing billions <laughs> of dollars then. Um, and, and so we had yields of 5 to 8 percent. We had inflation above 3. We had an inverted yield curve, a soft landing, war. I mean, you can line them up. And, and there's, there are a lot of similarities. But what I'm concerned about and what Arthur, my partner, is concerned about with inflation is that, yes, the rate of, of change has declined, but embedded inflation, what, the, what people live every single day, is still up 18, you know, depending on the sector, 18 to 35 percent. And so I think as a as a investing class, we have to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. We pay attention to the rate of change, but 
what will impact earnings? The fact that um, consumers are going to have much less money to spend uh, if, if the embedded rate doesn't come down. And I would just point out that there's about a billion dollars a day in stimulus, consumer stimulus through SNAP, through um, student loans, among other government programs, that is being pulled away. And so I think that's starting to show up in some of the used car. You know, those, those prices aren't just declining, they're collapsing. And you're seeing a lot of the same cars coming back. Um, so I'm, I, we are watching that, and the way that Arthur's positioned is he's um, increased his exposure to floating rate debt mm. as well as some of the typical uh, inflation uh, areas, commodities. So, Thank you for explaining that. that I, I really do appreciate uh, your take on that. One thing that we've noticed, of course, no matter what the inflation outlook uh, looks like and how it changes, is this devotion to the Magnificent Seven, these big mega cap tech names um, that have become their own, as Jason Trenner of Strategas puts it, its own sector in many ways. Is that how you're thinking about in th this group of companies? Should people invest in them as their own sector that's separate from technology, that's separate from communications? I think it's a fascinating idea, and yes, I mean, I, I like a number of names outside the Magnificent Seven. There's a few that we don't own, but if you look at them as, as Jason has done, what you'll see is that not only is interest expense um, much, much lower than the rest of the market, so 0.6% of revenues, but EPS growth is 22.1% um, expected in 2024 versus 79 for the remaining 493. Sales growth of 125 versus 39 for the remaining, and then margins are going to expand at double the rate. So if you're worried about us going into a slowing economic environment, these are the names you want to own. Mm -hmm. And then I, I've written a lot about the total addressable market for generative AI and for cloud computing. Uh, this cycle is going to continue for a number of years, just like all the previous cycles have. Mm -hmm. They usually last anywhere from half a decade to a decade. Mainframe cycle was 20 years, but we're, we've shortened those cycles. Right. And I think this is where you want to be positioned. Uh, as we move forward in the decade. Nancy, unfortunately, got to leave it there. Got some breaking news. Our thanks to Nancy Tengler of Laffer Tengler. And let's get back to what's going on in Austin, Texas. We are getting some news on the pricing of the Cybertruck. The cheapest Tesla Cybertruck will be priced at $61,000 available in 2025. Let's go back now to Ed Ludlow. $61,000, Ed, the cheapest model. How does that fall right. relative to expectations? Well, it's well above the cheapest price bracket that they set in 2019, which was $39,000. Tesla just published these specs and prices to its website. Rear-wheel drive won't be available until 2025. It starts at $60,990, 250 miles of range. An all-wheel drive version starts at $79,990. It will be available for delivery this, uh, in 2024, sorry, 340 miles of range. And then Cyber Beast, the top spec, 99,990 US dollars, delivery in 2024, 320 miles of range. And if you go to the Tesla website, look into Cybertruck, it breaks down the different performance specs of those, but way above the price range. The average that most market analysts expected was about 50,000 US dollars. So even at the low point, the cheapest uh, Cybertruck, which again, not available until 2025, way above what some were expecting. All right, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, really appreciate your instant analysis there. Of course, as we get some pricing on that Cybertruck, if you're willing to pay up Scarlett, it looks like you could actually get it a little bit earlier than the cheapest model. Well, those people who did pick up their deliveries today clearly were not price sensitive <laughs> at all because they just bought it without knowing what the price tag would be. Yeah, some price insensitive buyers, the treasury market could use that. But we are moving closer to the closing bell. Of course, we're going to have full market coverage right here on Bloomberg as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. About two minutes away from the end of the trading day, Katie Greifeld and Scarlett Fu counting it down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell with the global simulcast. We're joined now by Carol Nasser and Jess Menton, bringing together all of our audiences across radio, television, YouTube, you name it. And Carol, it looks like in the last couple of minutes of trading, we did get a spike in the S&P 500, but we also know it's the final trading day of the month. You know why? You know why? Tell me. It's because the Cybertruck has <laughs> rolled know. out and we know how much it's, it's going to cost, 61000 uh, That's the cheapest and it's going to be available in 2025. Do you know Tesla's up about 20% this month? 
It's Magnificent amazing movie. Seven, yeah. But it's because of the Cybertruck, Katie. <laughs> it, is it because of the Cybertruck? Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, it is a moment for Tesla, and uh, it's really been a moment for markets because because beyond the Magnificent Seven, uh, we know that, of course, Jess, this rally has really broadened out this past month. Especially when you're looking at the S&P 500 heading into that final uh, minute of trading ahead of the closing bell, but you look at it, it's up close to about 9% this month. So this is its second best November since 1980, if you go look at SEAG Go and the terminal, Scarlett. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at Tesla shares. They're still down 1.7% on the day. I know that they're, we've been pretty obsessed with the Cybertruck for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes here looking at the pictures. And, and Just 15 minutes? I think, well, okay, last two years. How about that? But we really got some concrete hey, detail. It goes the last 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds. I'm feeling, I'm really channeling Matt Miller right now. There you go. We there could really use his expertise on this. Yeah, I'm maybe sure we can get him to uh, phone in. Um, <laughs> he might be busy, though. Max, Let's Max, take a look uh, at these closing bells. Of course, the bell is ringing people are clapping you take a look at how equity markets finished up it's green for the s p 500 uh had really accelerated into the close up about four tenths of a percent uh the nasdaq couldn't quite get there of course it had been looking at losses of about one percent will finish about two tenths of a percent lower you take a look at the dow outperforming up one and a half percent carol and if you take a look at the small caps as well i believe they strung together some gains as well all right good stuff i'm going to go back to uh, the big cap index the s p 500 most names in the index actually higher uh, for the thursday trade as we wrapped up the month of november scarlet uh 400 names to the upside 98 to the downside five unchanged and we see volume a huge pickup from the 20-day average, up more than 30%. That's as there's an MSCI semi-annual index review rebalancing taking place today. Also, end-of-month options expiring. And, of course, window dressing for some mutual funds because of the end of the month. And for them, uh, some of them, their fiscal year. Okay, let's look at the sector performances. Healthcare equipment and services, insurers, and household and personal products, each up at least 1.5%. On the downside, Tesla is helping to drag the autos and components index lower by 1.6% chip companies and media and entertainment. So a lot of those big tech names are the uh, decliners today. All right, good to know. So let's get to uh, some of the individual gainers, if I may. Salesforce, um, wait, is that right? Weren't they higher today? Yeah. Wait, did I move it? Wait. No, I see oh, Salesforce it is. It's up 9.4%. It's there. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, fat fingers for me on the terminal as I was pulling it up. Okay, so 9.4% higher. So pretty much holding on to the day's gains uh, and finishing at session highs. Uh, top of the S&P 500, the number one gainer, in fact. They gave a profit forecast. We all were breaking it down last night after the close. Uh, their profit forecast for the current quarter, top analyst estimates. So it did show some strong momentum uh, in its cost-cutting campaign. So big one and a big gainer there. Snowflake, another one. One, uh, certainly in this kind of uh, application software space, if you will, uh, up about 7%. It's a cloud software company, uh, reported third quarter results. It beat expectations and also gave an outlook that is seen as strong. So again, a 7% gain there. I want to mention Dollar Tree, home to Dollar Tree and Family Dollar. It was top uh, in the NASDAQ 100 today. Third quarter comp sales, they were missed. They cut its annual comp sales forecast for Family Dollar, slightly lowered the division's net sales guidance. But um, I don't know. The company, you know, reviewing its portfolio and identifying stores for possible closure. So maybe investors liked some of that in terms of what they heard. So that stock was up about 2% in today's session. And Immunogen, I got to mention, soaring some 82%. That's what happens when Avi uh, agreed to buy the cancer drug maker for thirty-one twenty-six a share in cash, equity value of more than $10 billion. And this is basically really cementing and helping to accelerate Avi's entry uh, into ovarian cancer drugs uh, treatment specifically, but the cancer treatments overall, Jess. Well, looking at some of the decliners here, of course, going to start off with Tesla, as Scarlett was mentioning, down about 1.8% today. So that was its worst day since November 22nd, so not too long ago. But this is the eighth biggest weighting in the S&P 500. And as we mentioned earlier, it's showcasing its first cyber trucks as part of that live streamed event in Austin. Another one I'm taking a look at today, though, is Ford. That's ticker symbol F. It's down about 3%, so worst day since November 9th. So that does come after the company actually did restore its financial guidance, though it did say profits would come in lower than earlier projections, a lot of that being due to rising labor costs. And 
Of course, Meta, another company, 1.5% down, worst day since actually just yesterday. But looking at that, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission did claim that its in-house trial violated the Constitution and asked a court to immediately halt the agency's bid to change a 2020 privacy settlement. But if you look at a monthly basis, all three are up. And as Carol mentioned earlier, Tesla up about 20% month to date. All right, let's get over to the bond market, my favorite place to be. And we actually saw that sell-off resume. We've been getting used to lower yields, not the case today. Of course, we did get some mixed economic data. You can see that percolating through the curve right now. Two-year yields up five basis points, and more so if you go out the curve. Uh, I thought it was interesting, though, if you think about, we talked a little bit about what we heard from John Williams, but San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly, she also said today that interest rates are in a, quote, very good place place to control inflation. She's not considering cuts. Of course, this is all a drumbeat until we hear from Jerome Powell himself speaking tomorrow. One of his last opportunities to speak before, of course, the December Fed meeting. Yeah, I'm glad you bring up what Mary Daly said in, in the context of she's not considering rate cuts because so many in the market have looked ahead to rate cuts. I believe uh, it was Chris Waller who, as Mike McKee was reminding us earlier, did talk about rate cuts generally without giving any kind of timeline, and that set people off to the races. Like, okay, it's happening, even though that was in the vaguest possible context. I Faster this... than a cyber truck. <laughs> yeah. I think this is uh, a pretty interesting headline. Money market fund assets rise to a fresh record. Record $5.84 trillion. This is coming from the Investment Company Institute. You know, Jess and I just had on John Augustine, Chief Investment Officer at Huntington Private Bank. He talked specifically, though, about investors moving out of cash and looking to put that money to work. So uh, less going in. So that's what he's seeing on a day to day basis. But again, some recent numbers from ICI just showing. It's at a record. And heading into tomorrow, Powell's actually on the calendar twice, speaking ahead of the blackout period next week. But something else that's an anniversary today, it's actually two years since Powell actually dropped transitory in front of Congress. Okay. It is. Today marks two years, so it was November 30th, of 2021. Chill, actually. So wow. it's been, and if you look at the SP 500, it almost looks like it's gone nowhere, but it's pretty much recouped all of the losses. But it's been so dizzying over the past two years when you think about where we've come and gone. But when you look at the SP, P500 in the chart back to those levels where it was two years ago. Yeah, it has certainly been a long, strange trip. Uh, we do have some earnings, so uh, I want to talk about Ulta Beauty here uh, because Ulta right now uh, shares are up about 5.6%. Uh, you take a look at what we got. You saw third quarter EPS beating estimates coming in at $5.07. The estimate had been for $5. Still sees uh, fiscal year operating margins between 14.6% to 14.8%. The estimate there had been for 14.7%. So uh, you take a look at some of these numbers, and clearly the market sees good news here. Uh, we're going to continue to keep an eye on that. All right, let's uh, move over to Marvell Technology. It's a chip device company. and. Their third quarter numbers, uh, on the bottom line, it is a beat by one penny, adjusted EPS of 41 cents. Revenue coming in slightly better than expected, 1.42 billion. But uh, the outlook for revenue for this quarter, the fourth quarter, 1.42 billion. Analysts were looking for 1.46 billion. And you can see those losses in after hours trading uh, deepen now down 1.3 percent uh, in after hours trade. Just want to get to Dell because last time that they reported uh, their quarterly update, the stock rallied 21 percent to a new record high. It's a different tone. The stock is selling in the aftermarket. Uh, third quarter total net revenue of 22.25 billion, a little bit light. Street was looking for 22.98 billion. Third quarter adjusted operating income 1.96 billion. That is a beat. 1.78 billion was the street estimate. Third quarter adjusted EPS a buck 88, and that is. Um, about 42 cents better than what the street was expecting, but the stock is down about 3.5%. Keep in mind, the stock is up almost 90% year to date. Uh, you know, looking last time around, it was kind of hopeful in terms of a recovery in the market for corporate technology, but we'll look for some insight uh, on the call and in the press release to see maybe why uh, there's so much. Uh, negativity in the aftermarket here. And, and Bloomberg Could be just and, expectations. Yeah. Also, Bloomberg Intelligence uh, heading into this report was signaling kind of this cautious recovery that we have seen in the PC market. So they were expecting sales to slip about 7% compared to the 13% drop in the prior quarter. So, Katie, do you have a a uh, cyber truck in your <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I mean, the apparently you only have to put uh, $250 down to reserve, so I'm thinking about it. But 
It's get on the mailing list, essentially. It's a little pricey, Buy the, uh, now, the pay sticker later. there. Right. Is that what that is? Here we go. That's a good point, Carol. I'll think about it. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Our cross-platform <laughs> coverage, wrapping up the month of November uh, and getting ready for the last month of trading of 2023. Uh, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals, we do it all across the Bloomberg world. We'll see you again tomorrow. Now coming up, major moves in healthcare M&A. We'll discuss the latest next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, trading is finished for November. You take a look at how we settled up. The S&P 500 finishing about four-tenths of a percent higher on this Thursday. It had been a pretty quiet day, but heading into the close, of course, you saw a little bit more action. The NASDAQ 100 still ending lower on the day, down by about three-tenths of a percent. We were looking at losses of about 1% earlier in the day, so a little bit of a pairing there. Meanwhile, no such luck in the bond market. That sell-off continuing. Yields rising by about eight basis points, but still levels very very low uh, relative to recent history, at least. Then you take a look at the dollar rising about four tenths of a percent, maybe a little bit of a haven bid going on there. Uh, but that is your broad macro snapshot. Let's take a look at some of the indivi individual movers. We've been teasing healthcare M&A all program, and we're going to get into it. But you, the headline there is that AbbVie is, has agreed to pay $10.1 billion to acquire Immunogen. Of course, you can see Immunogen shares absolutely soaring today. What's interesting, too, though, is that AbbVie shares are also higher to the tune of almost 3%. You take a look at Ford, though, of course, a little bit of a different story there. It restored its financial guidance and basically said that that six-week strike by the UAW is going to leave a mark on its profit, shares down about 3% or so. And then Snowflake, this is an earnings story. Of course, they reported after the bell yesterday. They beat on their outlook. Maybe some signs there that sales growth is stabilizing. That's good enough for a 7% gain. And of course, like I mentioned, this was the final trading day of November. And really, as you can see on this chart, it was a November to remember. November gains totaling in at 8.5%. That is one of its best November gains on record. You take a look at the S&P 500 going back many, many, many years. So whether this is something that can sustain itself, Scarlett, remains to be seen, but at least we had one good month. Yeah, or perhaps it pulled forward some of the gains that you might expect in December as part of that Santa Claus rally, but we shall see. Meantime, uh, you look at deal making in the healthcare industry, it is in full swing. Katie, you mentioned it. Avi's purchase of the cancer drug maker Immunogen for $10.1 billion, that's one of them. And of course, this follows Cigna discussing or starting discussions to combine with Humana, creating a giant health insurance company. Joining us now to put this all into perspective is Cynthia Coons, who leads Bloomberg's healthcare team. Cynthia, let's start with the deal that is official, which is AbbVie's purchase of Immunogen. Katie mentioned $10.1 billion on a per share basis. That's $31.26 a share. What's interesting to me is that Immunogen closed at uh, $29.33, up more than 80%, which is, of course, a reflection of the premium that uh, AbbVie paid, but far below the actual purchase price. Is there reason to think this deal won't go through? I think there's just been a lot more FTC scrutiny on deals and, and unexpected deals. And sometimes when you wouldn't necessarily at first blush think, oh, the FTC is going to take a closer look at that. I think they've just been paying a lot of attention to consolidation in pharma and healthcare in general. And that's sort of a theme, um, not just for this deal, but we also saw a lot of scrutiny on the Pfizer deal for CGen. That's another company that, much like Immunogen, makes antibody drug conjugates, which is a very powerful new class of cancer drugs high demand for that. There's a lot of interest from pharma. Um, I don't think that means the deal won't get done, but I think the days of maybe trading up to the offer price are just, that's just not where we're at right now because mm. I think our investors are just, just a tiny bit more cautious. They're just going to wait and see a little bit how the regulatory landscape plays out. But this deal doesn't have as much overlap, say, that you would expect that it would get stopped in any way. But I think there's just a little more caution this point. Well, let's talk a little bit more then when it comes to that antitrust landscape right now, the regulatory landscape when it comes to the Cigna and Humana deal. Of course, they're in talks. It's not exactly the same situation as what we're talking about with AbbVie. But when you think about the, the overlap and the potential for concern there, how does that look when you think about Cigna potentially combining with Humana? That's a deal that I think will, there's 
so that is a different reaction from the market. The shares were down yesterday. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more concern that the FTC could actually potentially even prevent a deal like that going forward. And that's because that industry is far more consolidated. And so Cigna is already out shopping around its business in Medicare Advantage, partly because that would getting rid of that would make a deal with Humana make more sense. But there is also overlap in the pharmaceutical benefits manager space, which they're both in. That's the piece of the business that determines um, sort of drug pricing, yep. if you will. It's sort of a middleman piece, but it's very important. The FTC has been investigating PBMs now for over a year. So I think there's just a lot more concern about what's going to come up in Washington if, if you merge two health insurance giants and two pharmaceutical benefits managers just because they're just there's so few players in that space. And zooming out a little bit, of course, Cigna, Humana, that's a very uh, different deal, a very different industry than, of course, AbbVie and Immunogen. But talk to us a little bit about this uptick that we're seeing in healthcare M&A. My understanding is that it's been pretty quiet for a while. Is this the start of something sustainable or is this just coincidence? Oh, I could certainly see more from here, especially from pharma. Big pharma has a lot of big drugs that are going off patent. They need to replace that revenue. That's what's going on with Abby. Humira is already facing competition. They need to figure out what to do next. Merck needs to figure out what's coming next. Pfizer needs to fill a hole that COVID left behind. So I think pharma especially, you're going to see them trying to find strategic deals that make sense for their portfolio. In the healthcare, the services space, the insurance space, there could be more activity. I think it really depends on what happens. If, if Cigna and Humana move forward and if, if how regulators react to that will dictate a lot of what happens in that part of the um, ecosystem. But I definitely think pharma, I could imagine it could, it's going to just get busier from here. So next year will be an election year. And in previous election years, there's been a lot of hoopla about whether Obamacare is going to go away. That's not coming up at all this time around, is it? Well, I, and I, I yeah. ask that insofar as whether the companies in the healthcare space need to kind of position for changes in policy. I don't think they're doing that yet, but I think they're very familiar with how quickly things can change yeah. and what they may need to do. But I don't think that's anything that people are necessarily laying substantial groundwork for yet mm -hmm. um, at this point. But I do think just in general, elections create a lot of headline risk for companies. And there have been comments that have come up in debates that have sent pharma shares lower or forced pharma companies to reevaluate how they do price increases. So the election is something to keep a close eye on. And I think people in the industry know that. There's definitely risk that comes in and, and potentially some volatility from that. All right, Cynthia, really appreciate you breaking it all down for us. That, of course, is Bloomberg's Cynthia Coons. Now, coming up, it's Bloomberg, or rather, it's Disney. Let me rephrase that. Disney versus Nelson Peltz, the magical mouse house, rejecting his bid for two spots on its boards. We'll discuss what's next, of course, as Peltz says it plays, it plans, rather, to fight back. This is Bloomberg. Let's talk about Disney because activist investor Nelson Peltz was denied a spot on Disney's board after that company rejected his bid for two seats. And of course, this comes after Disney appointed Morgan Stanley's James Gorman and former Sky CEO Jeremy Derrick to its board. In a statement blasting the decision, Tryon says that while these appointments are a step in the right direction, they, quote, will not, in our view, restore investor confidence or address the root cause behind the significant value destruction and missteps that this board, the Disney board, has overseen. So let's take a deeper dive into all of this with Geetha Ranganathan, Bloomberg Intelligence Media Analyst. Um, Geetha, what does Nelson Peltz want to do as a board member of Disney? What is he pushing for? Yeah, Scarlett, so uh, what's old is new again at Disney. This is the sequel because, you know, Peltz had already kind of pushed for this a little bit earlier this year at Disney. Uh, and then once he kind of got what he wanted, which was, you know, a, a major restructuring effort by Bob Iger, as well as over five and a half billion dollars in cost cuts, he kind of uh, abandoned that whole proxy fight. But he's back again. We're not really sure what he wants, other than the fact that he does want the board representation. He hasn't really articulated what exactly he would have Bob Iger do differently. So if we've kind of, of course, the share price underperformance is something that he's going to keep highlighting. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And, you know, since he kind of went away in February, the, the stock price is down about 20%. But Bob Iger, I mean, to his credit, he's kind of done everything. I, I think he's got, kind of gone over and above uh, mm -hmm. what he had initially promised. So uh, if you're looking at the cost cuts part of it, you know, uh, he's delivering now $2 billion 
in in addition to what he had originally yeah. promised. So we have seven and a half billion dollars in cost cuts. Uh, you know, they are obviously streamlining the whole streaming division. They're looking to, um, uh, you know, uh, make it profitable next year. Uh, and then again, they're they're doing everything they can in terms of articulating a future strategy for ESPN, as well as kind of reinvigorating the co the content assets, especially the studio, which has recently underperformed. So I'm not really sure what exactly he's looking for. You know, I, I think it's a little bit of a, of a distraction at this point uh, for Disney. So here's the other thing. There's some drama attached to Nelson Peltz's holdings in Disney because my understanding is that Nelson Peltz is working with a former Disney executive, Isaac Perlmutter, who owns 78 percent of the stock that Tryon beneficially holds. What, is there a backstory here that we need to be familiar with in order to understand what it is Nelson Peltz is trying to effect? Yeah, so Disney actually came out with its own statement right after, uh, you know, Peltz uh, and his team issued the, their statement where they basically said that they think that, you know, this is almost kind of a personal vendetta by uh, mm. Tryon uh, going after uh, Bob Iger because he had ousted um, Isaac Perlmutter, who was, you know, the chief of Marvel. Um, uh, this year, actually, in March of 2023. And there's some bad blood, I would say, between Iger and Perlmutter. So remember, you know, uh, Bob Iger had purchased Marvel from uh, Isaac Perlmutter back in 2009. And they, you know, the, he had obviously tried to kind of institute a lot, lot of changes. Kevin Feige, who was the head of Marvel, was in the center of them. You know, Perlmutter wanted to fire Feige. Uh, Iger wanted to keep him on. So there has kind of been a lot of controversy. There's been a very complex and I would say a fractured relationship between Iger and Perlmutter. And so obviously Disney kind of thinks that this is almost like a vendetta against uh, Iger. So there's a long personal history here, of course, uh, something to keep in mind when reading all of this. But of course, something that Nelson Peltz has criticized Disney over is its CEO succession. Of course, Bob Iger coming back, displacing Bob Chapek. When you're looking at Disney and you're thinking about this, of course, you've called this activist fight basically a distraction for Disney, but when it comes to succession and finding who's going to be the next Bob Iger, I mean, how are you thinking about that when you're analyzing Disney? Yeah, with, with Disney, it's always, you know, the next Bob Iger is always, you know, the, the next is Bob Iger himself, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, we really still don't know exactly what's happening other than what he said yesterday, which is that he is definitely going to leave uh, Disney at the end of 2026. Uh, that's all that we really know. He, you know, all that he's offered in terms of a succession uh, commentary is that, you know, it's it's robust, it's ongoing. Uh, the one little comment that I would make here is that they did hire a CFO uh, recently, Hugh Johnston uh, from Pepsi. So that kind of, you know, and this is a, somewhat of an uncharacteristic move, I would say, for Disney, because they typically always kind of look internally for candidates and promote from within. So the fact that they were, you know, kind of willing to go external does indicate that they might be also looking externally for, you know, a CEO replacement down the road. And uh, Geetha, I'm glad you're here with us because we are getting some breaking news on Disney. This related to its dividend, uh, Disney reinstating its dividend to 30 cents a share for the second half of 2023. So uh, maybe some good news there. The stock little change in after hours trading. But that brings us to the stock reaction and investors in Disney. Of course, they're watching all of this play out. You called this a distraction for the company. Is this a distraction for investors and shareholders in Disney as well? I mean, just the fact that they kind of reinstated the dividend today after all of this drama with Pels, I mean, just shows that, um, you know, obviously uh, th th there is going to, I, th I think Pels, the, the one good thing, if you if, if if there's anything good coming out of this, is that is that his involvement does kind of bring some short-term focus back to, to Disney. I mean, they are, uh, they are going to kind of have to speed up the process to, uh, you know, move forward their strategic goals, whatever it is. And, you know, the restoration of the dividend obviously speaks to that. Um, you know, I think investors are kind of going to be 50-50. You know, obviously having him there is going to keep Disney management on its toes. Uh, but then again, you know, he has to kind of articulate a clear strategy of what exactly he wants the Disney team to do. All right, Geetha, really appreciate your time. Your instant analysis, that is Geetha Ranganathan over at Bloomberg Intelligence. And uh, a lot to keep track of when it comes to Disney's activist fights. Yeah, I really like what Geetha said about how this Nelson Peltz uh, seeking two board seats is a distraction. That might lend credence to the idea that Disney feels the need to reinstate the dividend, of course, on top of the bigger than expected cost-cutting program. But fun fact, uh, Nelson Peltz is Brooklyn Beckham's father-in-law. Yeah, yeah, you know, son and... Son of David Beckham and Posh Son Spice. of David Beckham, and you have to wonder whether he watched the uh, Beckham documentary. I did. It was pretty good. I did, but, too. Yeah, yeah. We both liked it.
Well, coming up, we're going to speak with Caden CEO John Roa about their latest consumer spending report, how Americans are affording their holiday spending. That's next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Katie Greifel. Let's take a look at how markets performed on the day. On this final trading day of November, quite end to a big month, but there is some green on the screen there. You can see the S&P 500 finishing about four-tenths of a percent higher, uh, swinging back from losses earlier in the day. All told, the S&P 500 of about 8.5% in November. Uh, I think that's its best month since July 2022. Meanwhile, you did see a sell-off in the bond market today. Uh, Ten-year yields up about eight basis points, but remarkable moves for the bond market in the month of November as well. By some measures, the biggest rally since 2008 or so, or perhaps even further. But the Bloomberg dollar index as well, also gaining about four tenths of a percent, maybe a haven bid on an otherwise quiet trading day, Scarlett. So part of what's been driving equity markets and the bond market over the month of November is this idea that the Federal Reserve is done with its interest rate increases. And new data out this morning shows that U.S. consumer spending, inflation, and the labor market are all slowing down, giving the Fed room to not hike anymore. Here with all the details is Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abigail? Well, Scarlett, let's take a run through. And of course, we had uh, jobless claims come out today uh, for last week. They came in a little bit higher than the week before by 9,000 coming in at 218,000. That was in line with uh, the estimate, but again, to your point of a little bit of slowing, certainly they're on a week uh, over week basis. Uh, PCE, the Fed's preferred way of looking at inflation, came in at 3%. The expectation had been for 3.1%. The prior month of uh, September at 3.4%. So inflation slowing, another uh, green light perhaps for the Fed to be on pause. And then pending home sales dropped. That's a look forward. Uh, it came in at minus 6.0%. 6.6% uh, versus uh, minus 8.8% and minus 13.1%. So this is actually moving in the right direction, but still it is down and it's a look forward on the housing market. Now, PCE of all these numbers, clearly the most uh, important. In fact, uh, some are saying that of the threshold in terms of when the Fed may in fact uh, truly pause or even cut, it will be PCE and unemployment. Take a look at PCE back in 2019 and 2020, below the Fed's mandate of 2% and then as high as I think 7.5 or 6 percent uh, in July of 2022, and right now uh, at that 3 percent. So moving in the right direction, but the Fed may uh, want to really see that uh, sustained inflation is down, maybe even below that mandate some are expecting. And then bringing it all together with the consumer, well, the consumer seems to be in good shape. The estimated retail sales or holiday sales for 2023, close to a trillion dollars moving in the right direction. Not a ton of growth over the last two years, Katie, but enough. And I think that the big winner, of course, is pay now, buy later. What does that say about the consumer? You have some mixed signals there, I would say. All right, Abigail Doolittle, thank you very much for that wrap up. And let's stick with the consumer here because in their latest consumer spending report, Caden found that a large part of this year's holiday spending is being financed by savings rather than debt. And for more, I'm pleased to say we're joined by the CEO of Caden, John Roa. And let's talk about that savings rather than debt. Of course, one of the narratives making its way through depending on where you look at, is that savings have been dwindling. So how much longer is that going to be the dynamic? The party could be over on that. And this is our early analysis. We're going to have more information on that towards the end of the year. We can kind of look at both Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and Christmas put together. But really, um, our data is showing us that, that the, the spending, which has increased in our projections, not decreased, which was the kind of consensus, is really being financed through savings, uh, potentially through buy now, pay later, but really not from debt and not from credit cards. Talk to us a little bit more about buy now, pay later, because some of the stats for uh, the Black Friday period have just been staggering, especially even compared to last year. You've yeah. seen this tremendous increase. 
What do you think is actually driving that? What does your data say about buy now, pay later? Well, I think it's because um, of interest rates, first of all, on the credit cards, and people are afraid of kind of you know getting too aggressive on that payment method. But also because this is being financed by savings, you can use that to stream out payments over many months as a type of either low interest or interest-free uh, debt. And so we are seeing as, as high as seven to ten percent buy now, pay later in the total uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday payments, which is crazy. How does that compare to the previous year? We don't know yet. So we're actually still analyzing that kind of as we speak and that's to be part of our end of year economic outlook. So when you mentioned that spending has increased, um, is that because of inflation or is that because people are actually spending more because there are more deals that they're, uh, they, they can't resist? Yeah, on an adjusted basis it's, it's, it's increased and um, by our estimates as high as like 44 basis points against mm -hmm. the consensus which would have been down 10 basis points. And as Abigail just said, as we're seeing with the real data coming out now, mm -hmm. it might be right and we might actually be on that side of the projection. And of course, October 2023 was the month that student loan repayments resumed after a three and a half year period where they were suspended. Do you see any material impact from that? Were you anticipating any material impact from the resumption of student loan payments? Well, this is what's interesting about us because we're, we're, despite sitting in this chair, we are not a kind of financial analyst company. What we are is an artificial intelligence company who's yep. able to kind of see a different lens into consumer behavioral data, data that real human beings are sharing with us willingly every single day, hundreds of millions of data point. So we can actually look in and see, you know, uh, repayment to student loans. We can see buy now, pay later and not have to infer or guess on those right, metrics. And right. so we are analyzing all those things in real time and again are looking at the end of the year as kind of making a prediction into 24 on where those things are going to go. And what does your data say about pricing power? Because, of course, we've been talking on this program about how when it comes to inflation, okay, the rate of change has cooled down, but the absolute level of prices is a lot higher than it used to be. And you think about these spending patterns, how much more can retailers actually increase prices at this point? It seems like quite a bit so far, especially with increased kind of gross spending uh, throughout this weekend and projected through the holidays. Um, and so it looks like the, that, that elasticity is working, and it's hard to say kind of where that will run out. But if we switch over from kind of savings to true debt and kind of you know, ongoing debt into 24, if this is the end of the party for savings, that might change pretty quickly. And just talk to us through the implications of, okay, maybe the party is over, maybe uh, the financing does switch from savings to debt. I mean, what are the broader implications of that? Should I be scared? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I am not as smart as you guys. I, I am a, a lowly tech CEO, and so we get to look at it from kind of more of the AI angle and let the data tell its own story and not kind of be the analyst as much as let this, this explicit data kind of tell us what's happening next. Um, but I do think that this could heavily impact kind of the economy and spending in the first half of next year if our numbers are in fact right. What does the data show about pricing power among services versus products versus physical goods? Yeah, I mean, we, that analysis is not complete yet because we want to see it through the full holidays. But so far, it does appear that services are way up. We talked about, I heard you talk about streaming a little bit earlier. Yeah, we're there seeing, are all these Black Friday deals. We're seeing the exact same trend. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're definitely, expect a lot of um, HBO Max subscriptions uh, as a gift for you. What Katie? could be a better stocking stuffer? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, John, really enjoyed this conversation. Of course, that is John Roa. He is the CEO of Caden. Now coming up, the stakes are high for this year's UN Climate Conference, known of course as COP28, as it gets underway in Dubai. We'll discuss with Ed Crooks. He is the Vice Chair of the Americas at Wood Mackenzie. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Oil prices falling more than 2.5% today after OPEC Plus agreed to deepen its production cuts. And of course, this follows a slump in oil prices and predictions of a renewed surplus next year. We have members of the group agreeing to cut 1 million barrels a day. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Devika Kumar. And Devika, there's a lot of drama surrounding this OPEC Plus meeting because it was delayed once and it was held virtually. Um, give us the backstory here about the dynamics within the group. 
Yeah, so obviously lots of drama. This has been a long time coming in a way, starting in June. Uh, African member nations in particular have had some displeasure about the quotas that they've been given by the broader group. And that's kind of where the source of the tension lies this time around as well. And if you see today, it was actually quite surprising that Angola came out after the meeting and they said, we're not going to stick to the quota that we were given. We're going to produce above that. And African nations in particular have been looking for a way to expand investments in order to grow their output. So it's obviously vital for them to be able to do that. And that's kind of where some of the, 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 the tension is coming from. And so talk to us a little bit about oil's reaction to this news, the news of the cut. Of course, as Scarlett mentioned, take a look at crude prices right now, falling 2.7% on the day. Had investors and traders been hoping for maybe something bigger here? Yeah, that's definitely part of the story because most traders are already priced in an extension of Saudi Arabia's cuts, which we did get. Now, the additional cuts on top of that were a surprise. However, now it's starting to look like there's not a lot of cohesion within the group because we didn't come out. There wasn't a, a press conference after the meeting as there normally is. Um, now traders are wondering whether member nations will actually follow through with some of the pledges that they've made. So there's a lot of questions still. And David, we've spent a lot of time this week kind of making fun of equity strategists who've uh, gotten their year-end forecasts for the equity market wrong. But you think about some of the uh, forecasts, the predictions for the oil market, and I feel like it has been all over this place this year. I mean, we got as low as $63 a barrel on crude intraday, got as high as close to $95 a barrel. Where does that leave sort of the investor class, the uh, the analyst class that you talk to heading into 2024? What is the consensus here? That's a great question. I mean, we're coming off of two things today in particular, if you want to illustrate the point, really, we had uh, Bank of America had a call with their global head of commodities research, and he was talking about how one of the biggest surprises this year was how strong U.S. production has been. Yes, people modeled a growth in shale output, but no one really expected the amount of growth that we got in the end, which is about a 1.5 million barrels a day, which is a significant amount of supply growth from the U.S. Now, on the flip side, you also have demand numbers that on a weekly basis looked really bad. Uh, on a weekly basis, the EIA was saying in September that we had seasonally uh, a two-decade low. Mm -hmm. Now, n today we had fresh data, monthly data, that showed demand was no nowhere near that bad. So a lot of these numbers have been changing once you have the more concrete monthly numbers come out and supply has surprised on the out upside. So it's going to be challenging going forward next year as well, particularly given demand is difficult to track real time. Yeah, there's also uh, some expectation that there's going to be more M&A in the big oil space. Of course, you had uh, Chevron buying Hess um, or announcing the purchase of Hess, Exxon making its own deal as well. How does that play out in oil prices? Do oil traders look at that carefully and respond to it? Is it a knee-jerk reaction? What have you observed? I think so far, it, it, it really, it takes a while for the M&A activity to filter through in terms of supply, and then ultimately that affects prices. So it's still early days. There's a lot of talk about whether it will drive increased efficiencies, where we might see, for example, the Hess acquisition, is that going to be a revival for shale basins like the Bakken, which don't get as much attention as, let's say, the Permian Basin of Texas. So, uh, you know, the Bakken has actually been one of the basins that have surprised analysts this year. It's been stronger than expected. So we could start to see some incremental growth from some of the second tier, second tier shale basins as we get more m and activity. All right, Devika, really appreciate your joining us. Devika Kumar covers oil and oil companies and oil trading here for us at Bloomberg. And of course, the future of oil is among the key topics as more than 120 world leaders and thousands of delegates, you could even say tens of thousands of delegates, attend COP28. This is the annual UN Climate Summit, and this year it is taking place in the UAE. The stakes are high, of course, with 2023 set to be the planet's hottest year on record. Joining us now is Ed Crooks, vice chair of the Americas at Wood Mackenzie. Um, good to speak with you, Ed. Give us some context here with the UAE hosting um, COP28. How does that frame the discussions that will be had here uh, and, and frame our expectations for what can come out of this event? Well, probably you'll have seen there's been an enormous amount of controversy about this and people have been saying, well, it's a, a bad idea to have the UAE, obviously a very significant oil producer with plans to keep on increasing its oil production capacity. 
uh, as the host of these talks. And in fact, the president of the talks is uh, Sultan al Jabba, who is the chief executive of Admiral, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. So that's attracted a lot of criticism. There's been a lot of noise around that during the year. I think a lot of that has been misplaced, really. I think if you think about climate change, it's a global problem. It needs a global solution. You have to get every country in the entire world buying into those solutions. And that includes the large oil producers as well as everybody else. And so it's very important that a country like the UAE is inside the tent, is in the talks, getting involved in the negotiations. And of course, the UAE has um, really ambitious goals for decarbonization of its own. So I think a lot of that criticism was unjustified. Mm. That said, it is clear that one of the big issues on the agenda is going to be sort of re reconciling the decarbonization agenda and the continued global effort to reduce emissions with continued demand for oil and gas. And that's yeah. going to be a big thing in particular to look out for just over the, past, over the next few days. And just to get the end of that thought is watch out for agreements to reduce methane emissions from all kinds of industries, but in particular from the oil and gas industry, yeah. because that's the way of cutting emissions while keeping demand for oil and gas going. Yeah, that'll always be the headline that anyone looks for. And yeah, it's, it's a really good point. I, I wonder, to what extent are any agreements that will be made at COP28 already agreed upon weeks in advance, kind of like a G20, where the communique has been negotiated um, to the final period and comma by all the delegates' staff before anyone even actually meets on site? Yeah, certainly there is a lot of that. And as you say, there's been intensive work in the, in the weeks and months leading up to the COP. And we've actually seen some evidence of that just today, that one of the big issues that's been on the agenda has been what we call the loss and damage fund. This is something that was agreed in principle at COP27 in Egypt a year ago, and that's meant to compensate countries for the damage that's been done by climate change. This COP was meant to be deciding financing for that fund, and that was just announced today. And at the opening event, countries said, well, and the UN said, and, and various countries said, we're putting money into this. There's a total of $300 million has been raised for that fund. UAE is putting in $100 million, Germany putting in $100 million, uh, the US $24.5 million. Now, you could say it's not very much in the context of damage being done by climate change, which probably runs into the tens of billions or hundreds of billions even uh, every year. But even so, it's a sign of progress being made. It is possible, despite all the tensions and conflicts that we have around the world, which clearly are overshadowing these talks, it is still possible to get international agreements and to make some progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, progress uh, being made, like you mentioned, of course, uh, about $300 million or so, maybe not huge in the grand scheme of things, but perhaps an early win here. And with that in mind, I mean, Thinking holistically about this COP28, what would a successful COP28 look like? Success would mean this uh, loss and damage agreement that we've already had. It would mean something significant on methane. As I say, look out for that over the next few days. We don't even know exactly what's coming. We'll watch to see how significant this is. Uh, another big thing would be the rules on international trading of carbon emissions, which are meant to be finalized. That was something which was first agreed in principle all the way back at uh, the Paris conference back in 2015. The rules should be finalized at COP28. If they are, that's definitely an important step forward. And finally, um, this idea of a goal to triple renewable energy uh, power generation capacity by 2030. If all of those things can be agreed, then definitely I think it'd be fair to say that COP28 has been a success. As always with these things, it's a bit like riding a bike. You have to keep making progress, or otherwise you fall over. Mm. Um, none of these things arguably are huge in themselves, but it's just a sign that if the world can reach agreement on these various issues, it's a sign that the broader effort to address climate change is still heading forward and is not grinding to a halt and collapsing. Right. Ed, at the risk of sounding cynical, I, I wonder how much COP28 turns into something like a green Davos. Uh, lots of performative talk, lots of focus on intentions, um, but not as much technical work. Uh, there's a Bloomberg Opinion column that was published today on how 70,000 people are attending COP28. That is up from almost 50,000 last year and 38,000 in Glasgow two years ago. I mean, what can really get done when you need every country in the planet to sign off on things and there are that many people attending and showboating? As you say, it's a huge event, 70,000, um, a record coming to COP28. 
I think you could put a positive spin on that and say it's actually uh, a great sign in terms of the global effort to address climate change that so many people are interested, so many people want to be part of it, so many businesses want to be part of it in particular. If we're going to shift to a low carbon energy system, that has to be something that is uh, an effort led by businesses, led by the private sector. And so the fact that so many companies want to be there at COP28 and showing what they're doing to take part in that effort, I think that's a really positive sign. Mm. Just in general, then, in terms of these kind of COP exercises, I think there's a certain amount of you know, glass half full, glass half empty. Yes. You know the world is not making as much progress as it could towards meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. But on the other hand, an enormous amount of progress has been made right. since 2015. And so certainly you could say that, uh, as I say, we may not be moving fast enough. We are definitely still going in the right direction, and COP28 is part of that. Ed, really appreciate your joining us today. Ed Crooks is vice chair at, of the Americas at Wood Mackenzie. And Katie, I think about how 70 to 80,000 people at one event, you know, it's, it's a great column um, about whether they really need to be there and what can actually get done. But maybe Greta has a way to unite them. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's uh, like you ran through sort of the comparisons to previous years. This has really ballooned in popularity. Yeah. There are a lot of people lining up to go uh, and actually be in person at COP28. And I like the idea of this maybe turns into a green Davos. So <laughs> depends on what your take on Davos is, whether yeah. you think it's effective <laughs> or not. Yeah. All right. Still ahead, we've got what investors need to watch for tomorrow. It is, of course, going to be Friday and the first of the last month of the year. This is quick. Uh, no, this is the close on Bloomberg. All right, let's look ahead to tomorrow now that Thursday is finally finished. Actually, tonight, I believe we have China manufacturing PMI. That is at 8.45 p.m. New York time. And then around the world, too, all day, we're looking at some global manufacturing PMIs. Yeah, for Eurozone, for the U.K., and for the U.S. And, of course, the dividing line is 50. Anything above 50 is expansion. Anything below 50 is contraction. So we'll be keeping a very close eye on that. And we have a lot to look forward to, including a double dose of Jerome Powell. That is at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. New York time. Of course, we're counting down to that December mm -hmm. Fed meeting. This is one of the last opportunities we're going to have to hear from Fed speakers, including Jerome Powell. So definitely could be market moving. And he's the onus will be on him to not sound too dovish with so many people in the market anticipating pricing in rate cuts for next year. Yeah, and then, of course, we have U.S. auto sales to look forward in, uh, when it comes to U.S. economic data. I don't think the Cybertruck sales <laughs> are going to be reflected in that. You're going to have to wait a little bit for that. But And then we also have COP28, the first day of COP28, kicking off tomorrow. It's a multi-day event, and, of course, there's going to be a lot of headlines around it. Almost 80,000 people attending this big event, so you wonder what can get done. But it is a big deal for companies and countries around the world. That does it for, balance, that does it for us. Balance of Power is up next. Have a great evening. This is Bloomberg.